There's no time. Hey everybody, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. This is actually going up on Christmas Day, you guys. So yeah. hopefully you guys are having a good Christmas. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can sit around and listen to us later on today. Yeah, we've with already your... started the Christmas feasting. I think tomorrow's Christmas Eve, right? Yes, it is. All right. We're, We're recording have... this on the Sunday. Already morning. cooked a turkey a couple days ago. We're polishing that off and um, doing the candied spiral cut ham tomorrow. Ooh, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Hell yeah. We're such gluttons. It's, it's like the a holidays. Week, it's a week of holiday food, me fucking up my diet, and trying to rest up from all this heavy lifting that a man does. You know, I'm just get, get big. And guess who's <laughs> with us? Got Santa. Got a light up Santa. You can't really see in here. Got Jesus. This is but, Buddy Jesus. This, that's Buddy Christ there. Buddy Christ. <laughs> from Dog go, What's up, man? <laughs> all right. Because it's his birthday. <laughs> and then you got, uh, got, got uh, Mrs. 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 Claus. Claus. Also we got little like bean baggies, puffy Santa. Yeah, I got bean bag. My grandma puffs, actually yeah. made that. Yeah, and I, I got. I don't have a lot of Christmas decorations, so I kind of had to improvise. <laughs> I got. I got my uh, intelligence glasses. Put yeah, these, he he got new glasses. Put these on, you immediately boost your IQ up about another 10, 20 Is that points. How it Make works? it sound like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I need this, some they're kind of like my uh, Anderson Cooper glasses. Well, giving see, you the news. <laughs> It's not fake news, though. <laughs> well, I don't know. Some of the stuff you say. Yeah. Okay. But as, honestly, like, look, I have different glasses on, too, but that is because my cool little black flame framed uh, reading glasses broke. Broke. And uh, since it's Christmas, I'm too broke to buy another pair. I gave so, them my So glasses. these are Tom's reading glasses that I'm using so I can actually see uh, the screen. Strangely so, enough, so I can actually my prescription read my is close to what she needs, so... I'm not that blind. I just yeah. need reading glasses. I don't need yeah. glasses in any other time. I just need it to see yeah. the computer screen and my phone. Other Same with me. I, I don't. I mean, I got perfect vision outside the arm, my arm's length. Yeah. But up close, you know, I need them to read. Everything's just kind of blurry. Yeah, everything just looks like the. As soon as you hit forty, just bam, and it well, happens. You, and it you, happens in like three months. Yeah, it was yeah. like for me, it was really quick. Because remember, yours had been going downhill a little bit like before me, because yeah. you're a couple years older. But mine was like actually really, really good. In fact, he would like call me in. Hey, I need your eyes. Like, come in here and read this tiny little, yeah, you know, script on this Can't like like anymore. the back of a spice packet or something. Yeah. And it's like just in six months, I just couldn't. I'm yeah. just like looking at it. I'm like, oh shit, I yeah. can't. Yeah, right anything. around forty, it just happens fast. Getting old. Sucks, like three months, three months. Within three months, you're blind. Yeah. Up close. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. really blows. I can't even paint my fucking fingernails without reading. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's, not sad. it's all right. <laughs> so yeah, since this is our extra special christmas special what i decided this uh, you guys it took me like so long because i think the first year that we did a christmas show we did the obvious thing that you would do which is like creepy christmas creatures we talked about krampus yeah. and bell snickle and all that not kind a of super stuff. popular show actually i had fun doing it though it was fun to do it because i love that kind of shit most people don't give a shit yeah <laughs> well either. because when you do seasonal shows i yeah. guess like you know but they got um, other things they're doing yeah so, and then I think last year we did one about, we did kind of a biblical mythology one. Yeah. Too. So we did Book of Daniel and Book of Revelation and stuff. Because yeah. I feel that's not really Christmassy, but sort of. Yeah, most of it didn't give shit about that either. And <laughs> it, was, it, it was a good show. But, <laughs> but this one I was like, well, I want to do something Christmas related, but also that's something like. Paranormal. Paranormal and like relevant to the show. So, so we got a good one today. Yeah. So here's one. And this is actually some shit that people have, well, people one thing that people have requested. Yeah. So as it happened. There were two very, very famous British alleged UFO sightings or paranormal phenomena type yeah. activity. Rendlesham Forest is the Christmas UFO case. Like in the same way that Die Hard is <laughs> the, the Christmas action movie. Yeah. No, people don't know that. It's the, everybody yeah. knows that. Rendlesham Forest is Christmas time. Everybody but then like and then while there's I was, another one too yeah and then I was saying because yeah. I was saying oh well Rendlesham Forest the, the very famous Rendlesham Forest incident happened on December 25th 26th 
And then while I was looking around, I found another one that is much less well known called the Warminster thing. Yeah. And this also, although there had been like little hints of it like beforehand, the main bulk of the action started on Christmas Day of 1964 and went on for several uh, subsequent years. And it's like, it's funny because I had never heard about it and it seems like... A lot of people don't know about a it. A lot of people hadn't really heard of it. Like I found some stuff about it, but not a lot that was super clear. I, I so. know I know quite a bit about Rendlesham. I've been looking at that case off and on for many years. I have my own opinions about it. You know, most aspects, I, I, I think I know kind of what happened with that case. Um, and being ex-military, I think I have something to kind of contribute. In, in, in my opinions, I think I can contribute into, this, into, the, into the scenario in which this case happens because... Being at Fort Campbell and being uh, deployed overseas in a couple different places, including like the DMZ in Korea and some stuff in Egypt, we had to do missions like that, like perimeter security and internal security of bases. So I know how that shit goes, and I know what it would be like if you filed reports like this, What, how the chain of command would react. It's always kind of, always kind of made me think there was something to the Rendlesham case, because... I sure as hell wouldn't put up reports like that. It would be your ass, you know what I mean, to put up reports like that. And the lead officer in charge of that, um, I think he's a credible guy. I think I think he did see what he says that he saw. Now there's a bunch of stuff surrounding that case that we'll get into later. That um, you know, on a case by case basis. But Jenny Jenny's done some good investigation. We're gonna try to we're gonna try to we're going to try to whittle Rendlesham down into what most likely happened in that period of time. Yeah. You know, because uh, I think there's some variations in the story. But we'll get to that. Yeah, big time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so that so we decided to do that for our Christmas special because it's like paranormal UFO. And we don't do a lot of yeah. UFO stories, but we've had a lot of people request, particularly Rendlesham Forest. And I said, well, it happened around Christmas time. The Warminster thing happened around Christmas time. So let's do that for our Christmas special. Might do some other, you know, we might talk about other Christmas no. shit, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis as we kind of uh, think of it. But before we do that, let me get a little bit into a couple brief shout-outs. Um, if you still want more Christmas stuff from us and you haven't seen our last movie retrospective, we actually did a Christmas movie double feature. Christmas Evil, yeah. which uh, was from 1980, also called You Better Watch Out. Kind of a Christmas slasher, not really, but kind of a horror movie. And then we also did the 2018 Netflix movie, The Christmas Chronicles, starring Russell as Santa Claus. Yeah, that's right. If it was, you it, it was seen, a really good movie. It, it's, it's on <laughs> Netflix right now. It's a Netflix original. It's a damn Spielbergian epic about what would happen if Santa Claus was a man. I mean, a real <laughs> man. And of course, we know Crussell is a real man, and he's playing playing Santa. It's a super fun movie. It's a good movie. I liked it. We're I want to watch I, it again. Yeah, we're going to watch it again on Christmas Day, yeah. I think. With it, is a, it is a, it is a, a Christmas masterpiece. It is. I thought yeah. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. So yeah, check that out if you want more Christmas. It's like, what would happen if what? Die Hard was actually a Christmas movie? <laughs> <laughs> what else is it like? Okay. What else it's is it like? like? <laughs> I don't know, man. He doesn't know. know what else it's like. Also have a couple of uh, thank yous to send out at this Christmas season. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Melanie, for your very generous PayPal donation. You rock. Also, we have a new heavy hitter patron on our Patreon page named Cool Kitty. Yep. So thank you very much, you, you very guys. Much. Very much appreciated, especially during this time of year when I know everybody's, uh, everybody's finances are stretched yeah. pretty thin and we stuff like that. We know ours are. We spent all our shit on presents. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, it's like I said, it's way more appreciated this time of year because right. we know what situation most people are in. So let's kind of talk a little bit about this thing called the Warminster thing. Now, the first thing I have to say is it amuses the bloody shit out of me. Okay, now that this know. whole thing is called the Warminster thing. That's what they yeah, call it. The thing. The Warminster thing. thing. I don't know anything about this. She's kind of told me a little I bit. I didn't either until I started. Yeah, reading. and uh, so I'm kind of interested in hearing this case, and I'll just ride along with the audience. And if I come up with some questions, it's probably similar to the kind of questions the audience members might have. If you have a question, just ask. <laughs> we might tell you if we know. I probably yeah, don't know, now the show. Honestly. By the time you see this, the show's be over. So. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Look, so if you're watching this yeah. on Christmas Day, we recorded a couple days yeah. before Christmas. All right, so the Warminster thing. There, um, 
there's really no consensus on when the phenomena actually started. Now, it didn't really start out necessarily as a UFO phenomena. Now, where is this? Where is Warmer? It's in uh, Wiltshire in south in the south of England. Okay, so this is another English case just like Yeah, that's right what they both yes. Right along with uh, Rendlesham. I love when a theme comes together yes. like that. It's a Christmas theme, it's an English theme, it's fantastic. UFOs is a Christmas thing in the UK. I yeah, well I maybe. So. Well no, in the, well it's for Probably sure everywhere. they have ghost stories. Yeah. That's a Christmas thing. I'm just messing with you. That's why I always kind of wanted to do something around that too, but it's always hard for me to kind of cuz I love Christmas ghost stories and I feel yeah. like that's a tradition that's been lost over the years. But, you know, so there's this little town called Warminster. Now, there had been some kind of weird little reports of, you know, lights in the sky, shit like that um, in the early 60s. But most reports, you know, most stories about the Warminster thing said that the main bulk of it started on Christmas Day of 1964. Like I said, it didn't initially start out as a UFO phenomenon. It initially started out as an anomalous auditory phenomena so christmas day of 1964 apparently there were a whole bunch about 30 people in this town who reported being woken up about five ish in the morning by a really really weird noise now what some some of the people described it as a droning some people described it as sounding like um like leaves and twigs like a whole bunch of leaves and twigs being dragged across the rooftop some people uh, described it more of an explosion-y type noise or like a bunch of, uh, like a chimney collapsing, like a bunch of bricks falling on the ground. So a whole bunch of people said that they heard this particular sound on Christmas Day. So it was during the daytime. Well, it was very early morning. Very early morning. And no one actually physically saw anything. No one saw point. anything, not at this at stage. This okay. Um, and then now there when, was... Now I got a question though. What's that? They're saying that they heard this. Who did they report this to? Is this something that they called the police about, or is it something that they, that they, that they talked about in retrospect after this case had started? Now that to be... I'm not really sure because, like I said, there had been a couple of sporadic like report, like you, more of classic UFO style reports. Like earlier than that, there were yeah. some like in 1961 and stuff. So I'm not sure if they reported it to the press at the time, if right. they reported it to the police at the time. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, if I was sitting in the house early in the morning and heard something sound like leaves blowing across the dam. Or, or limbs going across the uh, the roof, or I'm not going to be calling the cops over that. So I was just wondering how how that yeah. how these effects got put in with this case. Well, and like I said, Plus, this case is very nebulous. Okay. Um, I had never heard of it. It doesn't right. seem to be a big. I mean, I'm not saying like apparently um, the Wiltshire area in England is a big like UFO hotspot. Like there's all these okay. like hills and stuff and a lot of like UFO watchers will go and sit on these hills and watch for them. Yeah. Um, and apparently it has been for a while, but as I said, no one was saying UFO at the beginning. They just said, what the hell are all these weird noises? So then evidently that same morning, which was Christmas morning, um, a little past 6 a.m., apparently there's this woman and her name is Marjorie By, and she's walking to church on Christmas morning and then she hears these similar kind of noises, like just coming out of thin air. And she claimed that they were so loud and so oppressive that they actually like stopped her in her tracks and like made her like not be able to walk further. Like it kind of like pressed down on her type of thing. Yeah. So this is the type of thing that was reported from Christmas 1964 onward for the next few months. Now, what did she say it sounded like? She didn't specify actually, but like I said, most people said it either sounded like, now later on, some of the people said that maybe it sounded like a really, really loud droning sound. Um, but some people said, you know, like I said, it was like a, like a scraping, like a really loud scraping sound or like the sound of a bunch of bricks hitting the ground. What? That's all very different. Yeah, but that's, okay. you well, know. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. We're going to roll with it. We're going to roll yeah. with it. And then I, I guarantee you, as this goes on, people, what's happening, as people witness things that are more dramatic than this, probably what they're saying to the interviewers, you know, early that morning I heard something. You know. Yeah, I like, think a lot of that type of shit happens of too. Because I think sometimes, you know, and this just kind of goes with any sort of paranormal um, phenomena that a lot of people witness or something like that. The, the minute that one person sees something weird or hears something weird, even if you yourself don't think of anything like weird of it at the time if you hear later reports of like yeah. oh i heard this right then you're going to associate it with that right. even if it yeah. was nothing to do with it so so these 
these sounds might just be based upon like some kind of like some psychological effects of giving a report. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, later on I saw some lights, and uh, it, and then they ask they ask the person, did you hear anything strange earlier on in the morning? He's like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Although, like I said, really, no one reported seeing anything until many, many months later. And this was, like, different people. Whoa, whoa, okay. Okay, so that's weird. Why would they remember these weird sounds at this point? And then, okay, well, I'm see, at that roll. stage, I'm thinking probably, yeah. since the two um, events were so, you know, there was such a large gap in time, I'm assuming that the people that heard these weird noises well, did report them to someone at the time. Okay. Because otherwise, it wasn't like the same th the thing where oh we saw something in the sky and then earlier and then today I heard later. No, it was no, it was like six months. Okay, and then later investigators come in and then they find out that there was a weird there was a weird phenomenon that had happened months before and then they write that into the case. But oh, I can see. That yeah. Happen. So oh. yeah, that that could be true. Also, okay. that like people went back and said, oh, all these people heard these weird noises okay. six months ago, and maybe that's really Related yes, to this thing. To so this. they might be relating to things that yeah. are not related. True. Okay. So evidently, six months later, June 1965, uh, there was a family and they were in a little town near Warminster. They and 17 other people saw a bright glowing cigar shaped object in the sky, just your standard uh, UFO. They saw this while everyone was out fishing at the lake or what have you. So a lot of people saw this? It says 17 people. 17. Yeah. Were they all in the same area? Do they know? Or they yeah, scared? it yeah. seemed like they were all like fishing and swimming, like in this like watering hole or like okay. by a lake or something. All right. So they said that they all saw like a cigar shaped uh, thing. Right. Now, a couple months after that, uh, in August of 1965, uh, in the middle of the night, it was about 345 in the morning. Uh, another woman in Warminster was awakened by another strange sound. Now, she uh, she said that it sounded like a really, really loud droning. And that she went to the window and looked out and saw a really, really bright object in the sky that looked at, like it could have been a star, but much, much bigger and brighter. Um, perhaps the moon. <laughs> okay, now this cigar-shaped object that they saw, did, it, did they say what color it was? Just shiny? Just glowing. Glowing? Yeah. Right, or no descriptions on the size or... If it was moving, um, like that? some I think maybe later on some people described it because I think later on some people saw one like hovering over a road and said it was okay. orange. Um, and then I think another woman later on described a different one as like being as big as her bedroom wall, like you know what I mean. But she was yeah. seeing it from far away, from but far it was away. as big as her bedroom wall. Like that's so, how she was assuming. Sounds like a vapor was. trail with light shining off of it. You know what I mean during the well, yeah, dusks. You know during sundown. But you know, okay, it could be anything. All right. So okay, now at this stage, you know, the, so far so fairly standard yeah there's weird noises yeah people are seeing ufos in the sky and maybe these things are related maybe it's some kind of paranormal activity maybe it's something else um warminster is actually close to a royal air force base so people were saying uh you know maybe that had something to do with it maybe it was experimental aircraft or what have you um but really the story didn't take off until this dude named arthur shuttlewood comes along now at the time uh, that all of this phenomena was going on, he was actually just a journalist for the local paper. So he was just sent there to kind of report on the story because it was an interesting, you know, local story. However, as the years went on, he got much more involved in these. And then he ended up writing a couple books about the Warminster thing and going completely off into cloud cuckoo land <laughs> you know what i'm saying like all the like he's talking about like talking to aliens and they came to his house to visit him and all this other kind of stuff so this guy it seems like he started out just like oh i'm gonna go cover this crazy local interest story about all these people that claim they've seen ufos or heard these weird noises and then he decides i don't know if he just like went crazy like you know naturally or if he just decided hey i'm gonna make some money off this ka-ching and i'm just gonna like come up with the crazy you shit but look I don't at his finances to that's see what i mean now he's passed away at this yeah. point he, he died in 1996 but so the thing is though there was so much interest about what they already were starting to call the warminster thing because they didn't know if it was a ufo they didn't know what it was because like i said of the sounds and the sightings they didn't know if they were related so that's just what everyone called it the warminster thing so because there was a royal air force base nearby because pe some people thought it was aliens some people thought it was you know experimental aircraft or whatever 
there was a lot of interest in it in the town and like a lot of people around in the area that were kind of into ufos and stuff started like mobbing the town and like coming and sitting on up on all the hills like to see if they could see anything and all all this other kind of stuff now actually local officials were interested enough in it that they decided that they were going to have like a town hall meeting and they were going to like put it on TV and everything so that everybody could like discuss it and like they could talk about what it was and shit like that. So they were going to put it on uh, national television in August of... That's weird because yeah. it's so nebulous and the differences, you know what I mean? Each report seems to be widely separated from the other ones. Yeah. That's why they just call it the thing. Yeah. Like it's just a weird phenomenon that was happening. It sounds almost kind of like a... I hate to use the word mass hysteria. Not really. it sounds like uh, it has been speculated, yeah. sure, that it could be mass hysteria because it does have some of that uh, some of that aspect to it. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's, I think it might be what it is—the beginning of a local culture. You know yeah, what I mean of kind of reporting and looking for weird things, maybe because other people saw it. It could be because kind you like know, like a mad gasser. That type yeah, of that's what I was thinking too. And it, and it should be noted too that this particular area of Wiltshire. Um, is very rich in folkloric history. Like a lot of the like hills around there were supposed to be, you know, you know like Druids or the devil yeah. built it or something like that. So there's like a lot of folklore and legends around this area. So it might just be that people are just modernizing, um, you know, folklore from the area to kind of be more alien centric. The British have this thing that they, uh, that, that they call taking the piss. Well, Taking yeah. the piss means fucking with you. Maybe these people <laughs> are just taking the piss. We'll see. We'll see. Well, now one guy, that's actually a good segue because one taking guy the piss. who definitely was taking the piss okay. was this guy named David Halton. Now he lived around there and he decided what he was going to do. He was going to show up at this town hall meeting. Now he had been telling people around the town that the weird noises in the sky had actually been killing pigeons like he was finding like all these dead pigeon bodies everywhere and it was the sound was doing it so like the ufos were like killing these pigeons yeah. so he had kind of started spreading that story around um and he also said that he had um like a big file with like a bunch of sightings the ufos and photos and photos of the dead pigeons and everything like that so so he did have some evidence uh, well he said yeah, he did said he but did. see that's the thing he's like so everyone, all the townsfolks were like, well, hey, why don't you bring it to this convenient town hall meeting? He's like, oh, yeah, well, um, I'd love to do yeah, that, but yeah, I don't yeah. really think that's the right venue yeah. to be showing this kind of, you know, sort of... Uh, Every this venue guy... is the right venue when you have right. evidence. <laughs> so the thing about it is that, so sometimes, like, because um, I read a bunch of different accounts of the Warminster thing, and they're kind of wildly all over the map. It's kind of hard to determine what actually happened and when, but... A lot of them do have the detail of like, oh, the sound, the sounds were so loud that it killed pigeons. Yeah. But evidently, this part was completely fabricated. Um, that guy actually never showed any evidence of that. And in 2005, he actually told the newspaper that, yeah, I just made that up just for shits yeah. and giggles. Now, you do find lots of dead birds sometimes, but there's always an explanation. Well, like, yeah. yeah the, a flock of birds gets involved in some poison that was up on a rooftop. That's one. Yeah. Another one, sometimes you'll find a bunch of them dead on the ground, usually underneath a, a light in a parking lot. It's because when they're flying in certain lighting conditions at night, if there's a little thin sheet of water on the, on the ground, the reflections of the, of, the, of the parking lot lamps make it look like there's a, a deep enough body of water to land in. And that whole flock comes in for a landing, and the, one, the lead bird splats right there on, that little con, on the concrete, and the other ones can't. They can't stop in time, so they all just crash pull up, land. Pull up! Yeah, they can't, can't pull up. And they can't. They just <laughs> all just go headlong in, into wet concrete. Ah, boom! That's you know? terrible. Yeah, and then afterwards, you know, when when the morning comes, people are like, "How did all this happen?" Yeah, because you can't. Be you didn't. You weren't. You didn't have the point of view of the birds trying to come in for a landing. Well, you think that people wouldn't think it was that strange because I mean, if you have reflective windows on your office building, yeah. as I they'll hit that an too. office building I used to work in did. We had fucking birds hitting that every single goddamn yeah. day. Just whack. Yeah. And that's what's happening with the ground. That Either they think the water's deeper than it is, or they miscalculate the distance to the surface. That's another thing yeah. that can happen. Just like the same way they run, they don't see glass. You don't see the glass yeah. and they try to fly through it. Or it's, a, it's reflective. Yeah. Like a mirror, and they think they can go through it. It's that same effect. Well, yeah. that's yeah. Wet concrete kills lots of birds under certain lighting conditions. I mean, I can see how you'd be freaked out, like yeah. coming out of your house and there's like all these dead birds. Like yeah. Burn, yeah, that would be and freaky. And it's usually but... after a storm. Yeah. So sometimes they associate it with the storm. They think, 
well, they must got struck by lightning in the sky and they all came down. Or maybe <laughs> that was got, some lightning. <laughs> uh, another, thing that I, another, another explanation I heard before it was really properly explained to me. Uh, they got caught up in a tornado and then yeah. they all, you know, got deposited. They got blown around in, in circles and all got killed and they were all deposited in the same area. Whee! It's not how it happened. No. If you were to see it happen <laughs> from the point of view of the birds, it would make perfect sense how it happened. They were trying to land on what they thought was a thick body of water. Although I feel water. like if you're kind of already inclined to believe in paranormal things yeah. and you actually did witness like a bunch of birds just flying into the ground, yeah. you would probably attribute that to paranormal causes too. Mm-hmm. Instead of just them not being able to see. Couldn't what really they... judge the distance. Yeah, that's so, what I mean. Birds mess up just like people yeah. do. Even though they're a lot smarter than some yeah. people I know, but they still do mess up every now and then. The I don't only know. Ones, what... The only ones like these, the, the only cases like these that kind of sometimes make me wonder is when they find big deposits of fish. Yeah. And want dead fish, and some of them are slightly kicking still, just on the ground. Yeah. You know, I've read a couple cases like that and then, during storms. Yeah. You know, they thought maybe they were picked up by a water spot. By a water spot, yeah. But they would be strewn everywhere. They wouldn't all fall in one spot. I think it's probably more likely they were in a big barrel or a bucket in the back of a truck where maybe they were going to go stock a... Or in a plane. Or in a plane. Something. And they were know. frozen. I don't know. Well, a lot of times they're still kicking. Yeah. And they find them. I don't know. That's pretty weird. Know, that's weird. But here, okay. Better, somebody just made those stories up. Well, yeah, that's, in, you always you know, have to yeah. you have to you always have to keep that possibility right. in mind. Too. I saw some photographs of it, but it was in one of those like mysteries of the unexplained type books. Yeah, and, and that's kind and of their bread and butter. Of, to... Yeah, you see a bunch of fish on the ground, but you don't have the context. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. what, they just buy some fish and throw them on the ground, or you know, you don't know. Ooh, that's a good idea. Yeah. We should do that. Look, look, paranormal activity. Yeah, buy a bunch of fish and throw it on the ground and go. Yeah, water spout brought them here. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. So now right here, this is my actually absolute favorite part of this story. So remember I told you about this Arthur Shuttlewood fellow that was like a journalist, a local journalist, and he was the one that started, uh, you know, writing about the Warminster thing and then later went right off the rails before he wrote a couple books about it. Okay, now this is what he claims. He claims that on, that on September 26th of 1965, he says someone called him and this person that called him said they were from another planet. Okay. Yeah. Call him on the phone. The, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's long distance. <laughs> I guess it was. That's long distance. Right? No, because no, because then no, he was in town. Oh, he's in town. Okay. Yeah. He said that he was from a planet called, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Esta, Esta, something like that. You see, it's right here in my notes. A E S T S A. He said that was the name of the planet. And the caller. Esta. 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 Yeah. So um, he says the the alien, uh, the alleged alien on the other end of the phone, says that his name is Carne, and um, Carne, right? <laughs> Which Chile con Carne, I guess, but with a K. <laughs> okay, all right. And maybe it's Carney. I'm not sure, but it looks, but it's spelled like Chile con Carne, except with yeah. a, except with a K. So evidently, Arthur, who was no dummy, asked this caller. You know, you have to prove that you're really from another planet. You can't fool me that easily. You yeah. got you come over so I can have a look at you. Yeah. And then he says, only a couple seconds later, yeah. someone knocks at his door. <laughs> he opens the door and he's like, and there's, he didn't really describe him. All, it's like, I haven't read his book. I just kind of read a summary of it. He says he was kind of like a funny looking dude he just didn't have any pupils in his eyes. Like he had like the, you know, the, yeah, I guess. And then that his cheekbones and lips had like blue blotches on them. Okay. So apparently the alien spends about nine or 10 minutes um, in Arthur's house. And that, um, you know, as aliens at the time were wont to do, you know, said you need to stop with all these nuclear weapons and stuff because okay. there's going to be a World War Three at some point in the future, which actually was pretty smart because if Arthur Shuttlewood made this up, he could have said, oh, there's going to be awards in 1999 or whenever, like, the predictions were back then. But he just said, oh, it'll be in the future. So, you know, he's covering all the bases right there. Hey, well, uh, right here, <laughs> right here, either somebody's taking the piss out of Arthur or Arthur's taking the piss out of us. Out of everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, so he said, oh, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. He did some Nostradamus bullshit. Yeah. And then evidently. Um, Which we haven't gotten on a Nostradamus. Yeah, we need We're to, gonna do, have to do a show. On I that. know. We, I, I yeah. can't believe we haven't done a Nostradamus. Yeah, I like show. Nostradamus. Just that you know, we did one about end of the world predictions. We it's all in the interpretation of the quatrains. You know what I mean? 
and uh, that's that's the rub. You write it? enough stuff, and you interpret well enough, you can get a quatrain to fulfill just about anything. Yeah, well, that's that's kind doing. of that whole yeah. It's like well, every psychic in the world, yeah. you know, psychic with bunny rabbit ears, as yeah. Eddie Izzard says, um, is they know that your stock and trade is vagueness. Yeah, you're it's just reading tea leaves, literally. You have to be very you're very reading, vague yeah. about when and where it's going to happen. Yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna be in some of that trouble. stuff's off. You're gonna close. have a bad time. Some of that stuff sounds really close, <laughs> but yeah. But like I said, you're reading yeah. like a translation of a translation of, of a translation, translation, which might not even have been the correct through translation. modern eyes. Exactly. Yeah. So there, you know, people are massaging things right. after the fact right. to kind of sound like it fits right. in with you know what I mean because we already know that shit happened, so it's easy to kind of <sighs> being a oh, that's totally what he meant. Being an alchemist and a soothsayer and a seer, you know, that was a gig back in the day. You well, make, yeah, you like make, everything. Yeah. It's just like the gig you economy nowadays. Yeah. But, you know, back then, you're just like, you had to tell yeah. really good futures. Yeah. And like I said, the way you did that, and you learned it pretty quick, I imagine, especially back in those days where you might get your ass beheaded if you, yeah. like, fucked something up, yeah. is like, you really have to kind of keep it, sort of keep it positive, all keep it vague. I think, I think a big part of it also was uh, you had to really know how to entertain the nobility. So I think entertainment was a big factor. Well, yeah, you got to, they didn't have yeah. like, you know, movies. They didn't have yeah. Xbox back then. It's like, you know what I mean? Somebody just had to come over and like tell you jokes or something. Yeah. God, what a miserable existence. Didn't have any fresh Probably toilets or anything. Probably well, they didn't know any better, yeah. I guess. <laughs> if you had shit tons of money, I'm sure it was fine. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, Arthur also said that this alleged alien, Chili Con Carney, yeah. um, <laughs> that he was having difficulty breathing. Uh, that he had. Yeah. So perhaps this was a form that he had taken on yeah. uh, when he came to Earth and he wasn't yeah. quite, you know, maybe it was kind of itchy or did it fit right, the human suit? I'm not really sure. So, yeah, so uh, apparently, so he says he goes to shake his hand and, like, the, the alien was like, oh, that hurts so bad. And then he, like, wanders off, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Whenever I hear these accounts of, <laughs> of, of a, whenever I hear these accounts of, like, a 1950s style contact between humans and aliens, I'm already calling bullshit. I mean, Carne, that is yeah. such... Yeah, no, I'm calling bullshit. That is such a Roger Corman right. alien movie yeah. name, yeah. isn't it? Bullshit. I mean, what they all had K names, didn't they? Klaatu, yeah. and yeah. they all had names like that. No, real aliens wouldn't... K's get, or X's. Real a aliens wouldn't give a shit about us or what we were doing. See, I always no. wondered about them. I'm like, no. why the fuck would they come here? Yeah, it's like, yeah. I'm sure they could, like, maybe they'd scoot by and, like, check yeah. and it's like... It's, are they going to blow not, up the universe? They're not going to come here and give us magic no? technology. Right. They're not going to come here and try to solve our problems. They're not going to come here and try to stop nuclear weapons because that's none of their business. They don't care about it. I mean, we're not going to fly to other planets to stop cavemen from making fire. You know, because aliens would, don't care about nuclear weapons. They're like, oh, yeah, th those old things. They wouldn't care about them. <laughs> I have some of those in my garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> matches. You know, yeah, matches. Yeah. They wouldn't care. Big fucking deal. Yeah. See, that's what I always thought too. See, yeah. I think that a lot of the UFO thing, it's like people that are being really human centric, mm -hmm. and you think because we think other humans are interesting, or we think ourselves are interesting, right, that they would then be yeah, you would assume that someone from another planet would think we were interesting. I have, I have no such. No, emotions. I don't think they would. Be. It'd be like me going out in the backyard and find a pile of ants. Yeah. And go, and I'm not gonna go to the ants. Go take me to your leader. I'm going to give you some matches. Although, how awesome would that be if you did? And they yeah, did. Yeah, I'm going to give you some matches. They shrunk you down, and then I'm you went down in the... <laughs> Who's in charge here? <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. <laughs> hey, I'm, let's watch TV. <laughs> there was a thing called the internet. The ants wouldn't, you know. You know you're just going to walk by them. Yeah. You're not going to notice them. Yeah. And uh, that's any kind of interstellar type traveling... Any, any kind of uh, civilization that can travel interstellar the, di the distances involved is probably no longer biological it's gonna be more like something out of 2001 well and you think if they were gonna come that yeah. i it, i feel like we're living not machines i feel like we're not interesting in enough to justify coming that far well unless, they're running like, around they're just running around doing their own business they have unless passed yeah by. they don't care unless like you said no. i think i think you're uh an your analogy of like a park ranger yeah. was a really good analogy if indeed there are extraterrestrials flying around every now and then and people do have seen them on occasion perhaps then i think that is the most likely scenario that they're yeah, just like little park they're little cops or park rangers and they're just yeah. checking out the outside of their little territory and i'm not buying it that these are are biological entities it, the, the what we know about technology and how things are evolving i am not gonna buy that anymore 
they're going to be living machines with godlike intelligence. And they're living inside of an internet in their own mind, interconnected with the other ones. They don't have physical bodies. They are that spaceship. And then they, they control robots and other little crafts. They're, a, they're kind of like a technological awareness or a technological being that exists inside of its own internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it controls crafts that go around to monitor our reality, but they're not really a part of it in the same way we are. I think they're mostly inside of an internet, which would be like a heaven to us. Yeah. So you could might say these are angels or these are gods, and they're probably uh, immortal because they're, they're not carrying on biology, which means that that would mean that you wouldn't need to go fast. So yeah, what? It takes ten thousand years. They along don't care. And take their time. So what? It takes a million years. Oh, they got up plenty of time. They don't die. Yeah. You know. Just like shit. I'm just gonna get in this car and just pop yeah, just put on one or the other. <laughs> okay. I would think that they'd be something like the like the the, the monolith out of two thousand one. Yeah. I think that's a, that's probably what you're dealing with. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. A, a godlike non biological yeah en- entity that's almost kind of like a group universal consciousness inside of like its own weird internet in its own mind doing things here they see us they don't even really notice us yeah like i walk outside i don't notice all those blades of grass you know yeah we're just part of the environment that's what i think yeah i I would agree with you there go back there go back there and see a a wasp nest you know i don't go oh man alien civilization look what they can build you know i'm so impressive these little moths i just spray them yeah, the, gonna... the other way. Yeah. and that's funny because wasps to them it's like that's probably like a big alien invasion it's like oh shit because it's like they built this whole little thing and now you're just coming along going yeah, yeah. with your death ray yeah. <laughs> sorry yeah. wasps so, you sting uh, if you didn't do that I'd leave you alone yeah I'm just I don't kill bugs willy nilly but I, I don't like them like there might be under there the... might be some living creatures out there that are at the same level of us but their chances are they're going to be very very far away yeah. And so we probably won't be able to ever contact them. And uh, if they were at our level, they would be dangerous. Because we're dangerous. So they'd be dangerous too. We wouldn't get along with them. Probably not. If they were anywhere near our level. Probably not. Because there's going to be a bunch of overlapping uh, interests. And we're going to start competing. Like any other species in nature starts competing against you. They start fighting. Yeah. So there's probably stuff at our level. It's just that it's going to be real far away. It's unlikely <laughs> you ever see it. Thank God. <laughs> not really you know what yeah I mean? you think we're bad to each other imagine how bad they'd be to us or we'd be to them you know be, they'd be something bad yeah it'd probably be, be like something out of alien yeah so anyways after uh carne allegedly popped around to arthur shuttlewood's place for some tea or whatever um over the next couple of months there were a bunch of very very odd reports in the same town evidently several uh different people driving along various stretches of road kept reporting that they saw people some of them were grayish some of them were naked one of them was naked except just a jacket which Mm. seems a little weird um some of the people reported that they had hit these whatever they were with their car and you know actually felt the car go over them but then like when they stopped and went back the body was gone um, some other people reported seeing people that looked kind of frog-like and they were like he- leaping around or like leaping into hedges and whatnot. So for like a couple months uh, that year, like in October and November 1965, um, there were several reports of that type of thing, which that really sounds like a mad gas or Mattoon type of situation where, you know, you hear one report, hey, I hit this gray guy that looked like, and then when I went back and the body was gone, it was like, it looked like a frog. It's like, you know what I mean? So there was a whole bunch of that. Um, That went on, I think, until about January. And then there was about um, maybe like a year where there wasn't really that many reports. It seemed to have died down a little bit. And then there came more UFO reports. Now, this one person in uh, January of 1967, this old guy reported that he saw a UFO hovering above a field. Now, he also said that he saw uh, two aliens with helmets get out of it and wander off into it's the woods. It's always like a 1950s style. <laughs> it is. So, I always you know. wondered about that because I said, th- now this is what this is what kills me. I'm like, why don't we ever see, like people report like a UFO and it landed and the aliens that got out looked like little jello cubes. Yeah. 
They don't. They always look humanoid. Or look like a centipede. Yeah, they always look humanoid, yeah. pretty much. I mean, it's really only the last few years in sci-fi that, and pretty much now, ever since Alien, you know, a lot of the aliens will look like big insects or something yeah. like that, which is probably more likely than human. I think it'd be more think. likely. But um, you know, they never look like anything other than that. It seems like, except the blob, which yeah. wow. Now that I'm thinking about it, that's really original. Yeah. Like just a blob from outer space. He looked, well, like a big, he looked like a big fucking Slurpee. Well, they're just talking about, with the blob, they're talking about the amoeba. Basically is what they're talking True. about. But that's pretty much the only one you saw like But that would be a pretty accurate, you know, you would think that, yeah, that could be alien. Just like a big amoeba. Big amoeba. Yeah. yeah. Or like the stuff. Wait, wait was yeah. that an alien or was that? I can't remember. I think I that was so, uh, something that somebody made by Yeah, accident. that might have been like an industrial accident. I can't remember. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Although it is on Shutter, so I probably have to rewatch it. But yeah, so like I said, this area of Wiltshire has a lot of kind of druidic legends around it and all the hills and everything. But, you know, over the next few years from like 1967 through like the early 1970s, the town kind of became, like I said, like a UFO hotspot. So like all these people, you know, little inns would open up and they'd have like all these tourists coming in and like sitting up on these hills, like looking for aliens and all this other stuff. Now... Evidently, later on, this Arthur Shuttlewood guy, who was supposedly got the visit from Carney, um, he actually went to his death, like, never wavering in his alien story. Hmm. And he, um, he pretty much became something of a messiah figure, it seems like, in UFO circles uh, in that area. Like, he was very well-respected, and he, you know, kept seeing visions of you know, supposedly kept seeing visions of aliens, like they come in his room and stuff. You know, your classic alien abduction kind of the stuff. The UFO scene has changed a lot over the generations, you know what I mean? Yeah. And a lot of this stuff, really, when you when you really analyze what it is they're talking about, has a very religious quality to it. Yeah. You know? And a couple, of the, like, a couple of the things I read about this, like, pointed that out. Yeah, it, it, it's almost kind of like a pseudo-religious cult. And they actually have religious cults, like Heaven's Gate and everything. You know, yeah, that, where there's a crossover, is, sure. Uh, uh, yep. And in a way, you could say that Scientology is a UFO cult. It know? is exactly that. It is, yeah, it is. A it UFO, is exactly it's that. A UFO cult. Yeah. Because it's basically it's like a religion, but it yeah. also has sci-fi, sci-fi like corporate too. sci-fi elements. Right. Is basically what it is. Yeah. I think the corporate thing was new. And but... that's all going away, if you ask me. When you when you talk to young people who are wondering, and or, or, when you talk to young people who discuss UFOs or are in the UFO thing. It sounds a little, a lot more plausible than it used to. Yeah. Because they're throwing out the bad cases and focusing more on just like sightings that Air Force pilots had and cops well, had. There's some of them that cops had, you know what I mean, uh, that, where there were two or three police stations. What was that thing called? The, the Triangle over Illinois. Yeah. That Illinois case. We did a show about that. Yeah, thing. they did see that. Yeah. Just whether or not that was extraterrestrial. I think it might have been some kind of stealth zeppelin, small stealth blimp. See, I always kind of lean something like that. that. I'm not saying that like everybody that sees stuff like that didn't see anything. I just don't necessarily. I mean, whether it was an and alien one craft got a or not, of that's a different question. He got a picture of it. All you could see was the the lights at the cor- at the corners, and it was all screwed up. But I know that they they saw it. You could hear you could hear the radio traffic between all the police uh, units that were seeing it. It's yeah. just that they didn't know what it was. Yeah. It well, you wouldn't. I mean, if you saw something low. like that up in the sky, sure. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's the thing. And I, and I feel like, well, plus, too, we've had, you know, all the science popularization and stuff. Like, look at, like, Neil deGrasse Tyson and people and, you know, Carl yeah. Sagan before that. Um, you know, shows like Cosmos and stuff. So people yeah. know how science works more yeah. than they did in the 1950s, maybe. Yeah. I mean, in the, if you see sci-fi movies from the 1950s, the ridiculous, ridiculous shit they shit say they in believe. there, yeah, that they believe and like people just like, oh, okay, yeah, roll yeah. with it. That's how yeah. science works, but not. That's it's not like how science works. you know, like one, uh, yeah. and I bring this up a lot. It's not uh, necessarily like science fiction or alien related, but there was one. I think it was uh, the uh, Colossal Man or something like that. It's the yeah. one with Glenn Manning where he gl- grows like to really big size for radiation. And actually, a doctor in that movie, well, he's an actor playing a doctor, says that the heart is one big cell. cell. Ridiculous. And, like, no one calls him on it. It's like, what the fuck? Where did you get your medical degree? Yeah. You know what I mean? Back so, in those days, you could just say anything science. Yeah, you could just... Cool. And plus, those were marketed toward children, and they knew right. children didn't were stupid and didn't know right. anything. So they're just like, whatever. Just make it up as you went along. But you think that the people that made it would at least... Go, hold check. on. We, got, we can't say that. 
I mean, or at least just cut that line out. I mean, how hard then. is that? I guess not. Yeah. It's, they really didn't. It's like, as, as much as people talk about the good old days, like I said, it's like the movies yeah. were really just very half assed. Yeah, and they were talking about, you know, our <clears throat> planet's 100 million miles away. That's pretty close. Yeah, you know, relatively. 100,000 100, miles, 100 million miles away, or 2 million miles away. Because like, people are supposed well, to be shit, like, that's oh. not even the moon. Or <laughs> right. Past, like, right past the moon? Yeah. yeah. Woo. Yeah. Wow, that's super far. They never even mentioned a light year. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't know what that shit was. Mm. Well, it, the people writing the screen list, they didn't know or they didn't care. Mm. They just threw that shit together in like a week or two. Mm. And so Roger Corman's like, we have three movies to shoot this week. Yeah. I don't even give a shit. But yeah, so that was pretty much the bulk of it. There were, there actually have been strange sightings. Like up until then, there were a few weird ones. Like in 1972, uh, somebody mm. saw another disc shaped object. This time they described it as orange. Um, they said that shortly after this, they saw a very, very tall figure with white clothing on, uh, that kind of like ran along the road, like in very strange, in a very strange way. Um, apparently this same being or one like it was seen uh, a little while later, like a couple months later by a different person who was driving along the same road. Um, same thing, had white clothes, was jumping over bushes and stuff. And, you know, this actually, this woman that had the second sighting that said that she saw this creepy figure... And she said she saw it and it scared her. So she like booked it home. And then she said a couple hours later, she was sleeping and then like at five in the morning, somebody rang her doorbell and she got up to answer the door and there was nobody there. Yeah. Woo! So yeah, that was that whole thing. But yeah, so other than that, like I said, to this day, uh, you know, it's still kind of, even though it's not as well known, I mean, obviously not as well known as Rendlesham Forest because everybody knows about that one. I had actually never, I'm not a big UFO buff, but I had never heard of this and it didn't seem like there was a ton of information about it. Uh, actually, the town of Warminster, a few years back, they commissioned like a, a mural, like on this wall in the town of like all these little aliens and stuff. It's pretty cute. I'll put a picture of it in the video. But so it's still a place that a lot of people go. And to this day, no one has... You know, obviously UFO sightings, blah, blah, blah. But no one has really uh, explained what the noises were, like what that whole thing was that started out the whole Warminster thing, which, like I said, just started out as an auditory phenomena. So I really haven't seen any explanations of what that might have been if it was indeed real, if people did actually hear so, that. To me, it sounds like a couple of UFO hoaxes yeah. woven in with some weird reports or some weird sounds. Yeah. And uh, I don't really think there's anything to it. If you ask me, not this one. Yeah, it does seem like one of those things where, you know, maybe there were a couple of anomalous incidents. And like I said, I think I was talking about this a little bit on our Mad Gas or Mattoon and Spring Hill Jack show, where I was saying, you know, maybe there was like one or two strangers, like maybe I heard like a really weird noise and I didn't know what the hell it was. Right. And then later on said, oh, I saw a light in the sky and I didn't know what it was. And people like conflated those two things and it became this big quote unquote thing and it became this whole thing. But I just thought it was interesting, like I said. I think it was more of a statistical anomaly. Yeah. There's a bunch of reports of different kinds of things happening in this area over a certain period of time and some investigators later on went and tried to weave all that together into one phenomenon yeah that's what i think it was it does definitely sound like that and it sounds like a lot of the mythology surrounding it came from that guy's books um you know he wrote a book called i think it was called the warminster mystery and i think he wrote one called in alien heat (laughs) <laughs> that Which, sounds like a porn movie. That's yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was like, Dang. is that really the title of it? I don't know if I want to read that. I want to see that. <laughs> I think that was the name of it. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, that sounds like one of those uh, weird alien erotica mm-hmm. books. Not that I've read any of those, but um, involves tentacles <laughs> yeah. and Japanese girls. <laughs> No, that's hentai. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that's that what is, it is. I don't think that is anything. Okay. Is it, hentai is not aliens though? It's more like a Cthulhu type thing, and aren't they like from the ocean? I'm not going to get into it. Yeah, we, should, we probably yeah. we don't we don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about that. All right. So before we go to the break, since it's a Christmas show, why don't we talk about some Christmas shit? Like what? what? what do, do you remember what the best Christmas present you ever got was, or what your best Christmas was, or a Christmas tradition? that your family did that you enjoyed that you miss something like that can you think of anything yeah okay i think probably the uh the best christmas present i ever got was when i was a little kid and i got that one of those right up there oh one of the uh you yeah. can't see but i can't see it right there it's great mazinga you got a great shogun mazinga. warrior Man, <laughs> I, that thing i love that thing i got two of them sitting up there one of them isn't finished though from the 1970s big old robot 
we and so little Tom like opened oh, it yeah. up and you were like ee! actually I think it was already open my dad had opened it up and set it up on top of the box <laughs> and all the missiles and everything because you know being my my dad being who he was he'd probably play with that shit before he gave it to me let's see how cool it looks <laughs> yeah, yeah I, can, 70s, I can see your dad doing that back in the seventies those big old Shogun warriors were quite different from everything else that was around at that time yeah yeah and they were kind of I always thought they kind of had these weird demonic look to them. They do kind of. Yeah, red, blue. I mean, you have a bunch of them. faces and They're stuff. in here like up on top of my yeah. bookshelves and stuff. There's yeah. like little robots all I love things. Japanese uh, robots. Yeah, he does. He's got yeah. like a shit. Go in a guy guys. robots. People, out they don't know what these are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. do. Don't don't assume that lo- people <clears throat> don't know. I like Mazinger. Great Mazinger. Get a Robo. Um, the theme Ray songs are, right. are fantastic. No, that's, yeah. I think the Jig. Getter the Getter Robo theme song is probably yeah. my favorite. Grandizer UFO. Yeah. Yeah. But they have like, have really good uh, theme yeah. songs. I can't remember if this was a Christmas present or not, but I remember receiving the and we were just talking about Weebles just now. I'm not going to say in what context, but um, <laughs> yeah. I received the Weeble Haunted Mansion, and it was this. It opened, I remember that thing. Yeah, it opened like a dollhouse. Yeah. And it was like, it was all, cra- and like the front door opened and closed and it creaked. And it came with like little furniture, like a little couch and like little stuff you could put in there. It came with a little witch with a little plastic hat that snapped on. It came with a little ghost that glowed in the dark. And it came with two little kid weebles who had the most hilarious, like horrified expressions on their faces. They looked like, oh, like that, like they yeah, were really it. scared. And there was like a, there was like a thing you could attach to the back that attached like to the chimney and it was like a secret passage and type of thing. Oh my God. I loved that fucking thing. Yeah. I wish I still had it. Actually, my mom, I asked her about it and she said it was probably in my attic somewhere, but I don't think she ever found it. I did find the witch weeble. Uh, but I can't find her hat anywhere, so I still have the witch weevil somewhere. But that was probably, I don't remember, if, I think I got that for Christmas. So that was probably my favorite uh, Christmas present. And I can, you know what I kind of miss? Um, we used to do, you know, my grandmother on my father's side, we always had Christmas Eve at her house. And she always put up her little tree that was on top of this very, very 70s like table that was made out of like strips of wood and it was painted like avocado green or something. So she put the tree on top of that and she always like went all out. She bought every, because you know, I have a bunch of cousins and stuff and she bought everybody like tons and tons of presents and she always would wrap them and put them all out like weeks ahead of time. So the day when she put all the presents out under the tree, like all the kids would be at the house like, <gasps> and then we'd like all yeah. be like looking around. It's like, which one's for me? This one's for you. This one's for you. And it was like, it was so cool. And like they sat there the whole time just like taunting you because you mm-hmm. weren't able to open them. And then so on Christmas Eve, the whole family would come over and then the adults knew that the kids wanted to open the presents, but they would not let you open the presents till everyone was done eating and they would take forever on purpose. So they'd just like be sitting over there at the table going, oh, I'm going to have some more ham. I'm going to have some more. And the kids are like, come on, you motherfuckers. <laughs> and we're just like over there sitting next to this, like, <laughs> like waiting to dive into this big pile of presents. And I really, really, I missed that because my grandma died many years ago. But, um, you know, and even then she was like too sick to do it for a couple years before that. But that's one thing that I always remember. We always did that on Christmas Eve. So it's funny because I'm always like more excited about Christmas Eve than Christmas Day because Christmas Eve, that was the big thing. That was opening all grandma's presents. And then like the next day we'd each get our own houses and like, you know, it was cool opening stuff from your parents too, but then it was over. You know what yeah. I mean? There was a lot more build up and a lot more excitement like for Christmas Eve. So I always kind of look forward lucky, to that. I was lucky because I was, I was an only child. So I got all the Christmas presents. You know what I'm talking about? Spoiled brat. Yeah, I was only. See, I have three siblings. They give me all kinds of stuff, and then they give me like one time I got hamsters. Got two hamsters and a half. How long did they live? They lived a long time. Actually, did they? Okay, that's good. I had a hamster, and it ate all its babies, and then it died. Oh yeah. No, they lasted a while, and then uh, (laughs) you know they get sick, they get fevers, and then they die. Yeah, they don't live very long. They don't live a long, but they lasted a little while. I was taking those hamsters. I, I remember I had pictures of them for that Christmas. I was probably about five. I was taking those hamsters and. Wrapping tinfoil all over them, make them run, and they're running, trailing tinfoil. And my dog was tripping. We had his dog, she's like, Whoa, what are those things? She'd need them. She was cool with them. She was just like, Yeah, yeah. She tried those to pick are, them up, though. Space hamsters. Yeah, you know, they tried, tried, tried to pick them up with yeah. her teeth. Like, no, 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 don't do it. You know? Don't eat the hamsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of dogs will eat hamsters. You can't, yeah, well, you, you I, can't I wouldn't trust them alone with, trust them, with them, but, you know, my dog wasn't mean. She was, I think she was trying to pick them up and play with them. 
Yeah. You know, get it's like, look, little fuzzy moving yeah, toys. Cover them up with tinsel and have them run around. That's back when we had tinsel on the trees. Well, now it's not. It is, it's just a mess. You don't want tinsel. Well, and also it's not good because we have cats and it's really cats try to eat. The it's tinsel. really not good to put tinsel on your trees if you have pets. I don't know if you guys uh, know that because if you eat it, it's really they really eat bad. it they and eat it and tinsel. it'll like ball up and they yeah. it gets stuck in their little um, intestines. Cats and stuff. running their trailing tinsel out behind their ass. Yeah, yeah. use little, little shiny yeah. streamers hanging out yeah. of their butt. It's ridiculous. It's bad. Our cat is already. She's yeah. been mostly good. She hasn't yeah. climbed the Christmas tree that I know of, unless she did it in the middle of the night. She yeah. did, however, uh, knock Christmas balls off. Knock a Christmas ball off, and then she jumped on it, and it broke. Yeah. Because see, the we had like glass ones. She looked but they at were, us like they break. Well, she yeah, said, they what break. The fuck? Yeah. <laughs> well, because all the ones on the bottom of the tree are plastic. Mm -hmm. Because she hadn't been climbing the tree, so like all the glass ones, like yeah. ceramic ones, are like high up on the thing. Put but the somehow plastic she ones got down them. low, but she got up to the, uh, she to the somehow, glass ones. She did it while we weren't looking. Yeah, she jumped on it. No, I was there. I saw that happen. Oh, you she saw jumped it? Okay. on it and it broke. And she looked at me like, whoa, where'd it go? <gasps> what did I and do? And I said, you broke it. And I started picking it up. And she's looking looking at the pieces, you know. She, and she just kept looking at me like, they break. I didn't know that they broke. <laughs> She's been, cookies a trip. She is. She's hilarious. Yeah. She's pretty been pretty good. She's actually mostly just been sleeping under the tree. Yeah. Um, we wrapped all the presents and put them under the tree, even though I was scared too, because I said she was just gonna tear the shit out of it. Because she loves paper yeah. and she loves to eat paper. Yeah. Um, and you know, I put a present for her under the tree. It's big and it has like toys in it that smell like catnip. So I'm sure like the the package smells like catnip. So I thought she's probably gonna like climb in that and just like tear up and put all the paper everywhere. But she's she has sleeping really, underneath there with the packages. So unless she's doing stuff in the middle of the night, which I'm sure she does, because every now and then I'll wake up in here. I'm not worried about her. Or she, you know, she goes in the right. bathroom and like knocks stuff off the yeah. thing, and you know. So we, that's the thing. It's like people could break into our house, and like we, it, it wouldn't even register because I'd wake up and hear a noise and go, "Ah, oh, baby cookie." <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not true. <laughs> I've heard strange, strange shit at night. Remember? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I jump up out of bed. Yeah. The, the weirdest thing yeah. I heard. Well, we heard the garage door opening by itself. Garage door I think we've by mentioned. Some, um, I heard the doorbell ring. Doorbell ring. No idea. Couple there. times. Yeah. It was like three thirty four in the morning. Four thirty. I heard some noises. I thought it was a voice, but I think it was just. Uh, I think it was Beijing. Beijing and Baby Cookie growling at each other. Yeah. Well, Beijing. Well, when it's the middle of the night, I guess she gets lonely. Yeah. So she comes into my office and grabs little toys off yeah. the, you know, like my little Nightmare Before Christmas and toys and calling. stuff, and then goes. Rah, yeah, starts crying. Rah, rah, yeah. Like really loud throughout the house. Like, look, I brought you a baby. Yeah. Get up. <laughs> it's very probably sad. about time for a break, though. Yeah, we should probably take a break, and then when we come back, we will talk about another British. Christmas alleged UFO sighting. Yeah, this is the, the best very one, famous Rendlesham yeah. Forest incident. So we will be back in just a few minutes. We're back on this extra special Christmas special edition of the 13 o'clock podcast. We got all our little Santas in the background, plus Buddy Christ. We got our uh, Christmas spirits in the form of I got a I got a screwdriver, and uh, you got a Kukulcon. Probably. Yeah, yeah. We should have probably got like some more seasonal. I was gonna get some hot chocolate and put some. Whiskey I drank in all that the eggnog. Shit. You did, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I had some. I drank. See, I don't like eggnog. I know that's, like, yeah. terrible. But, yeah, he, he had eggnog with rum in it, but he drank it all already. Like I said, we started celebrating early. We already had a, t a turkey and everything. All right, so this second uh, Christmas-era British alleged UFO sighting is the very, very famous Rendlesham Forest incident. Yeah. Now, by UFO enthusiasts, this is usually put forward as one of the most credible UFO sightings ever in the world although i have to say that the more i researched it the, it started to fall apart the more skeptical i became right and i was pretty skeptical to start with but see because it turns out that a lot of the kind of iconic details of this uh thing that kind of got repeated over and over like on various documentaries you know later mm -hmm. on um are not really what was reported at the time they're not a part of the original case it that seemed like a right. lot of stuff got exaggerated right. later on uh by people that were there so um but first let's kind of go into you know the 
pretty standard narrative of what happened uh, on this particular, and it, it was actually over, most of you say over three nights, but it was actually two nights like separated by a night where nothing happened. Um, so it's December 25th, the night of December 25th, 1980. Um, in England, there were two uh, bases, RAF Woodbridge and RAF Bentwaters, and these were staffed by U.S. military. Now, at the time, it was kind of a big secret that this was like a nuclear installation. Um, I think it's still sort of a secret, but I think it's more of like yeah, an it open really secret. wasn't supposed to be there. It was kind of a violation. Of a yeah, treaty. exactly. So uh, I think England it's still... wasn't supposed to have any kind of right. nuclear weapons within their boundaries, as far as I, I understand during during that Cold War treaty. But both sides were violating. Yeah. It was just part of part of the Cold War. Yeah. So like it I said, I cheat and get away with it. Yeah. I still think yeah. they don't really admit that there were nuclear weapons there, but I think most people are like, yeah, we know yeah. there was nuclear weapons. And they weren't missiles. Really... They were air. They were, they, they, they yeah. were just, they, they're bombs, basically. Yeah. So in between these two, uh, these are called the twin bases, and there's about two miles in between these. And in between these, there is a forest called Rendlesham Forest. So it's Christmas night. Um, there's this kid, he's 20 years old, uh, he's a patrol sergeant named John Burroughs, and it was his job on Christmas night to guard, uh, the East Gate at RAF Woodbridge. Now, shortly after midnight, um, you know, or, you know, once the 25th had gone into the 26th, he starts seeing unusual colored lights appearing through the trees that looked like they were maybe hovering or like moving around. Um, I believe at first he thought it was maybe a downed aircraft. Um, so he thought that probably someone should do something about that, like to check that out. So what? Now, do we have any information about how many times he's served on this gate? Was this his first night on oh, the job? Oh, I don't know. I never read that anywhere. A lot of times, I don't know how the Air Force has it set up, but a lot of times these kind of duties are kind of handed out over a rotation. Yeah. You might have to do it once a year. Right. You might have to be able to do it once every two years of your deployment there. You don't know. Yeah. I think these guys, actually, I think the Air Force, Air Force has a specially trained security force that always does security. Right. You know what I'm talking about? That's their job. Yeah. Now, I don't know how often they're deployed to gates and to guard posts. I don't know. I don't really have those details. Do you? Did you find anything about? No, they actually, they said that the one of the other guys, Jim Penniston, that mm -hmm. he had actually served on this particular base for two years, but I don't know about the other guy. I don't know about Burroughs. It just makes you wonder how used how used to this duty were they? I mean, how right. well did they that's, know yeah, that's an this? Important factor. Was this something they had been doing? Had they been pulling this duty for weeks on end, years on end? Is this their normal job or were they just tasked out? Because I used to get tasked out in the Army a lot. Like one night, I just guarded Tomahawk missiles. Yeah. Not Tomahawk missiles, we got uh, Hellfire missiles. Yeah. And I don't know anything about guarding Hellfire missiles. I just know how to guard things. <laughs> so I just sat there and, and looked at them. And on that particular <laughs> night, actually they were in a, um, an 18-wheel truck. They were in a, they were in a <laughs> so truck. So I just sat there and looked at the truck. Sat there and looked at the truck. <laughs> we had it stashed out in the back 40. You know, <laughs> Nobody knew where it was except me and the guys that put it there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it was millions of dollars worth of Hellfire missiles for the age 64s. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't my normal job. First time I worked there. But you were just there. around. But that job is the same no matter where you are. Well, yeah, it's like you're guarding something. Yeah. Just make sure nothing happens. If something right. happens, then call somebody. But on a, in a situation like that, if I was there and I noticed that there was a light shining through the trees, I would probably report it. Yeah. But if I worked there every night for weeks on end and I said, well, it's always those lights are always there, then I know that that's not an unusual right. situation. I'm looking at something that's on the ground and I'm just seeing it through the trees. Yeah. Which that could have been what this guy is reporting. See, I'm just trying to get down to the we'll bottom. We'll see, yeah. Like, is now... this guy seeing a light that's normally there and he's thinking that maybe it's strange? Or, does, or is he seeing a light there for the very first time and he's worked there for years? We don't know, right? Yeah. I don't, yeah, don't I don't know. know about that guy okay. particularly. Okay. He thought it was odd enough that he went and reported it to the security policeman on the base, whose name was Jim Penniston. Now, as I said, Jim yeah, Penniston that's not had saying much. Jim Penniston had worked there for two years. Now, Jim okay. Penniston said that he had never, uh, that he'd never seen, seen these particular okay, lights so in the, the woods before. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. However, he said some crazy he said some later other on. Stuff. So, like, okay. you know what I mean? But right. I'm just saying, I'm not, you know, I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just saying. Right. So he decides, yeah, yeah, we should. He and he was like, yeah, it's probably maybe it's a down plane or something like that. They didn't think UFO or anything like that from you know initial reports. I don't think they thought it was a UFO. They I'm thought just, it was a plane crashing. I'm just bringing this up. 
for the audience to let them know there's a good chance that these guys doing these jobs pulling these pulling this security job maybe they've never actually done that job in this location before that might yeah, have been maybe, yeah. and they weren't really sure what lights were supposed to be where well so from... this may have not have been anything unusual this might have been lights to something that was on the ground that's always there well i'll get into that okay because here's the thing uh from what i'm from what i read of it later on like and like i said i don't want to like give you it think away it was right always away. there huh? but yeah, yeah but right, i don't right. think that most of the young people on the base would have known that because i don't okay. know how familiar they were with the area because like okay. i said these were american service this men. is a key thing yeah because the entire event starts with this report yeah had this report not happened, the rest of the stuff probably wouldn't have been reported. Right. If this report is just a report of something that's on the ground, all right, that's normally there, then a lot of this starts to fall apart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, that's kind of what okay. I thought was happening. Because like I said, I'm not a UFO buff, so I didn't know. Like, I'd heard of this, and I think I saw someone on the Sci-Fi Channel about it, like a long time ago, and I think you've talked about it a few times, but I didn't know like a huge amount of the details about it. But like the more you read about it, to me, I know this is kind of like the granddaddy of all like UFO cases and stuff like that. But th I don't know. The more I read well, about it, the more I want to stop you right there. A lot of people think this is the granddaddy of UFO. I think there are much better ones, much well, yeah, better ones than this. Yeah, I think there are too. After reading, so just one. because there might be some imper imperfections in this case, doesn't necessarily mean all the other cases are false. I really well, yeah, so, that know, doesn't <laughs> no. that doesn't follow though. Right. You know it's what just I, mean? I think this is a sensational case. I think it's flawed. Although I do think that Colonel Holt saw some stuff. Yeah. Whether or not he misidentified it, I don't know. Uh, we're going to get down to that. Yeah. Now, as I said, at this stage, I'm just telling you what, um, you know, what the sequence of events is usually reported as, like on the Sci-Fi Channel documentary, and what the witnesses said many years later. Like I said, when I get into, you know, the end, I'll talk about what they actually said at the time. So I'm just, this is the story as it's popularly conveyed. Okay, so I'm just, I don't necessarily agree with all this stuff, all right. but this is how it's usually played out. Okay. So, uh, Penniston and Burroughs, um, they report to uh, the security tower and they said, okay, well, you can take somebody else and go out in the woods and see if you can see if there's a downed aircraft or whatever. So they get this other guy, uh, an airman, his name is Ed Kabensag. I'm not sure yeah. I'm pronouncing that right. So they go out into the woods um, and they... Okay, so they go out into the woods to yeah. investigate. This is where it begins. Yeah, now Penniston says, and he said this later on, uh, he said something like the air was filled with electricity, um, like you could feel it on your skin, like your, you know, I'm assuming he means static like your static yeah. electricity, like your hair was standing on. And um, he reported that his their radio stopped working. Um, now Penniston said that he had a notebook with him and that he saw uh, this craft that had landed in the forest and he said that he um he said it was about nine feet by six feet it was triangular um com it was like made of like this glass like it was very smooth Black, yeah. and it had weird symbols on the surface that yeah. he allegedly he drew. drew in his right. notebook um underneath this alleged craft uh was a really strong bright light that was pulsating and then like red and blue lights around the edges yeah and it wasn't it was it was hovering it wasn't really standing on anything from what i remember right the, well the, yeah the, but then the next morning they said they found landing lay, 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 they, like a tray in that same spot evidently yeah that's, okay that was that's the story anyway. so they're talking about a small craft yeah it looked like it's made out of black glass the size that they're talking about they're talking about a drone we're not talking about something that would have been manned. You know what I mean? Unless, a, unless the alien was the size of your hand, maybe. You know. Oh, I mean? wouldn't that be cute? Yeah. And he's he's vaguely saying it, it kind of is a stealth craft. In other words, geometrical, kind of pointed, triangular shaped, black. That's kind of like a stealth craft. Yeah. So this the description of the ship, if that's what you want to call it, or the probe, is vaguely like Earth technology. Yeah. Or inspired by Earth technology, if you ask me. Okay. Now, I kind of have my doubts about this part of the sighting because some other stuff comes into play. But, okay, what do you say after that? Yeah. So, evidently, like I said, he sketched these this alleged craft in his alleged notebook. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll know the reason that I'm using that word so many times later on. 
But uh, he allegedly wrote in this alleged notebook, lift off 245, no sound, no air disturbance, take off, unknown speed, impossible. That's what he supposedly wrote in this notebook at the time. So evidently they reported to one of their higher ups, whose name was uh, Lieutenant Fred Baran. Now, according to some accounts, they said, oh, there was a blip on the radar at about the same time that they saw this craft. Uh, that is a disputed uh, assertion. So the, so apparently these guys like put in some reports, you know, they sketched uh, what they saw in the sky um, at the time. And then the next morning, like early the next morning, they decided, you know, when it was light out, they're going to go to the clearing where they supposedly saw this craft and see if they could see anything. Now, has the report been put up by this point? By the, at this I'm not time? really sure. I'm okay. not really sure how that works. Okay. So they go to what is assumed to be the same clearing. They said that they saw three indentations in the ground um, that were in a perfect isosceles triangle. Okay. So you know, they do have photographs of this. I've seen it. Yeah, and they made plaster casts yeah. of them also. Now that night, which was uh, I believe the December twenty sixth uh, or twenty seventh, I don't think anything happened that night. Some sources state that like another, um, like an eighteen year old woman that uh, that also worked on the base that she saw like something that looked like an orange fireball or something like that. But that's not usually part of the official account. Um, but mostly then the next night uh which was i believe the uh i don't know if it was the 27th the 28th like i said the dates are really kind of strange um apparently they saw lights again so they go and get colonel charles halt who yeah. actually he was at like an officer's dinner party like a christmas party or something this is like the that second night this is yeah well it's actually okay. the third night because the second night nothing really nothing happened. really happened okay right so apparently this lieutenant named bruce england like rushes into the party and says it's back you know come see it there's these weird lights up in the sky so colonel charles halt who was at the time uh 41 years old um evidently he wasn't really buying it he's like whatever but he decides they're all going to go out in the woods and see what's going on now he actually did take a micro cassette recorder uh out into the woods with him while they were looking around they did not report anything about lights or anything until very very late the the um the tape was only about 17 18 minutes long uh because he didn't leave it running the whole time uh it's it's like he would tape for a couple yeah, of minutes and then, and then turn, turn it off and tape because he said he didn't want to run out of tape um but it's actually like a few hours where they're like tramping around uh the clearing where these uh, alleged depressions were, and no. then they're kind of like going across a field and seeing lights. No, and hold stuff on one like second. That. What's that? That first sighting. Yeah. Of the craft on the ground on that first night. Yeah. This was documented into a report and set up the chain of command. Do you do, do you know anything? Do you know anything about that? I mean, it had to have been reported, right? Because they told Halt it was back. They meant the lights. Re referring to the lights that they saw at the gate. Yeah. Not referring. Not referring to the landed craft sighting. Because... Did they report the landed craft? No. They didn't. One person, I yeah. believe it was Penniston, and I'll get into this later. Okay. He reported, I don't think he used the word craft, but I think he said that he saw something metallic or something like that, but he saw it in the sky. Right. That's okay. what I'm saying about a lot of details being added like later on. Okay. Because I don't think anybody's original report, it was just weird lights, like, right. through the trees. They didn't, nobody said anything about nothing was landed. Now, there were reports of, like, indentations in the soil right. where this, you know, in this clearing. But, you know, there is an explanation for that. Okay. And like I said, I've listened to uh, Colonel Halt's tape uh, that he did on the third night, and I've read the transcript of it. And um, he's pretty much agreed that, yeah, that's what I said. That's what we were talking about. Um you know what I mean? So there was that whole thing. So they right. apparently go and they says, oh, and then there was like uh, these marks on the trees yeah. as though something came down. Uh, you know, a lot of reports say oh, the radiation levels were like 10 times more than normal mm. um, and all this other kind of stuff. Well, here's the thing that really kind of like gets me with this case. One, the best part or the most sensational part of this whole report was seeing the little black craft, a little black triangular space probe. Okay. And going up and touching it and the symbols on it. If you saw some shit like that on duty and you didn't report that, you need to go to Leavenworth. Right. You know? 
him not reporting it, I'm already going to call bullshit on it. Well, that's if I was on duty and I saw some shit like that, I would have damn reported it. Yeah. At, at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if, if Reporting it later, no, that's the same as saying you made it up. You have to report it at that time. And that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. That's why even though this is touted as like a really like uh, credible case and stuff like that, a lot of the iconic details of it, uh, like you said, like the craft on the ground, mm -hmm. um, you know, Colonel Halt saying stuff like, oh, that he saw a craft and it was like dripping like lava or something like that. Yeah. A lot of that was a later okay. addition. If, um, I'm, if I'm on this nuclear equipped base right. to pull security. Yeah. Okay. 1980, dead of the Cold War. Yeah. And I see a black craft on the ground hovering. Yeah, you better report that. Yeah. I could, <laughs> and it's a small probe or drone. Yeah. I'm going to probably assume Soviet drone. Yeah. Some kind of exotic technology. Of course you're going to report it. Because, see, the thing about it, the thing about it, too, is that really, as it was reported in 1980, it was obviously not that big of a deal because everyone forgot about it until a tabloid in the UK called News of the World um, found Charles Halt's original memo uh, that he filed two weeks after the incident that was just called Unexplained Lights. It wasn't called Craft on the Ground. It wasn't called, it was just called Unexplained Lights that he had seen through the trees. And he filed that. Now this tabloid got hold of it and published it in 1983, added a bunch of details, put in some kind of implications that maybe weren't really in the memo, uh, stuff like that. And that's when it exploded. It's like three years later when it was published in a tabloid. Three years later, when it was published in a tabloid, vamped up. Yeah. Is when it blew up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, here's the thing. Okay. Now, as I said, that's kind of how the story goes with the, you know, oh, there's a craft, and oh, it had yeah. symbols on it, and all this other kind of stuff. Okay. Problem is, if you listen to the original tape that Charles Halt made on the third night, and like I right. said, this wasn't the first night, because uh, he wasn't there that night. It's almost like a different, this is a different event. Yeah. Okay. Now, he did see unusual lights that night. It should be noted. But the if you go to, um, I can't remember the name of the scientist that wrote it, but he wrote like a three-page uh, transcript of the whole tape, which you can find online. And the first two pages of the transcript are like nothing all that unusual. All they're doing is they go to the clearing where these depressions are. And the interesting thing is that Colonel Halt says on the tape when he sees the depressions, the first thing he says when he sees them is that, is that as big as they are? Like, so it's not really all that impressive. Right. Um, now, it should be noted, too, that the cops were called at the time, uh, and they looked at these indentations, and they said there was no pattern to them. So the whole thing about them being, like, in a perfect triangle and stuff was obviously a later... The cops refuted that, so they were, weren't in a triangle. Yeah, the, the, the police report that was filed at the time said they just looked like animals had done it. And most, yeah. most people that were familiar with the area said it looked like old uh, rabbit burrows, like a rabbit had been digging around. They were just little yeah, I saw, indentations. I, I saw like casts. And they looked old. I saw the casts and it looked like it was depressions made by something about the size of a volleyball. Yeah. It's made about that big around. Yeah. That's what it looked like to me. Not very deep. Right. It? And then there was stuff, and you can actually hear on the tape, you can hear they had like a Geiger counter type thing. Now you could hear it clicking. I'm not really sure where this like 10 times higher radiation than normal came from because the highest he ever registered was like seven tenths, which is like point. 07 like miller rentgens or whatever they call it which is Nothing. pretty much background radiation it yeah. didn't go any higher than that um on the tape because sometimes they're like oh it's kind of clicking like over here but he's like oh what's the reading on it it never went any higher than 0.07 so it's not 10 times higher it was just regular background radiation it did fluctuate so exaggerated the radiation but though. yeah so that's just what happens um, they also were kind of talking, the first two pages of the transcript, they were also talking about the trees around it and how they saw these marks in the trees that maybe that was from like a landed craft or whatever. But even then, like Colonel Halt says something like, oh, they look old. Yeah. And later on, when they talked to uh, foresters and stuff who worked in that area, he said they are old. Those are axe marks. Uh, we put those there to show that that tree is ready for felling. You know, we're okay. going to cut those trees down and sell them for timber. And uh, indeed, those trees were later cut down and sold for timber, just like, you know, the foresters were like, yeah, that's how we mark them. We put an old axe mark in there and uh, show that's how we know that we cut them down. So they cut them down. So that was also nothing. Um, and then the whole thing about... And I, I love this. But the whole thing about the lights through the trees. 
And I know that people who believe in like that this happened and like UFOs and stuff are going to like, I'm not going to say swamp gas, but it's interesting to note that the way that the lighthouse, you, the, yeah, it's the, light the light. lighthouse. Okay. It's the lighthouse. It's in that exact direction. I've seen, I've seen... And the way that he describes the light there, on the tape. Yeah. Because he's like, oh, look, they see the light. There it is. I see it again. It's in the same I RPM. see it again. It's the same. It's a five-second second interval, just right. like the Orford Ness Lighthouse, which was exactly due east from where they were, exactly five miles away. And yeah. he said that's about where... And he actually... Um, the younger kids on the base did not know that there was a lighthouse there. He knew there was a lighthouse, but he thought it was southeast because he was from the other base, like, he didn't usually, like, he wasn't usually on that base. So he was still thinking it was to the southeast, right? But no, it's due east from that particular base or where they where they were because they tracked them on a map, like, where they were at this particular time. So they said all the lights that they saw, um, you know, when they saw this big white light that looked like, because um, he was kind of looking at it through binoculars or through a night scope or something like that. And he said, oh, it's super bright and it looks like it's winking yeah. or it looks like it's darker in the middle. They said, well, yeah, that would be the lighthouse, like, coming around. Right. And then it would be blanking out in the middle because the light was so bright. It was like the second brightest lighthouse in the yeah, UK I've at seen the time. A I've seen a reconstruction where they take a camera and shoot that lighthouse in low light and then link it up with the tape. And he's going, see that light? And he goes, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. There it, is. there it comes again. There it comes and again. It, and it does it at that same. Uh, I, I think at that time, at that in that part of the uh, of the tape, I think they are looking at the lighthouse. Yeah, they really do seem to be because, right. like I said, you can match it up exactly. Right. As soon as the other person says on the tape, there it is again, yeah. here comes the lighthouse light again. Right. And also it should be noted that um, at one point Colonel Halt says that he sees five red lights and that they're steady and that they're not blinking. And he sees them, like, I think to the right of the main light. That's on those antennas. That's the transmitting station yeah. for the, which had five radio towers right. with red lights on top of them. Now, the reconstruction I saw, the trees were mostly gone at that time. But maybe back then, they were, the trees were higher. Yeah. Or they were closer to it. So yeah. it was more obscured. Yeah. Isn't that what you think happened? Yeah, because if they you... They weren't seeing them real clearly. Because if you look at, like, the, the people that, um, you know, that saw it on the first night, they did actually sketch what they thought the lights were and the best sketch of it, which only really one of the, one of the people saw and like sketched it, um, looked like something that was mostly obscured by trees. So you wouldn't really be, it just kind of looked like a really bright, like pulsating light, like coming from between the trees from far away. So that could have been anything. And honestly, there were like a lot of UFO sightings that particular night, that Christmas light, but it should also be noted that there was a very, very active meteor shower that night. Uh, meteors were reported actually from much earlier that night, which was uh, Christmas night. There were some reported around 7.20, I think. There were some reported like right after dark, about 5.20. And then also later on that night, uh, there was a Russian rocket that had like deposited a satellite and it had broken up in the atmosphere, like right over that part of England. Um, so some people had reported seeing like kind of a fireball or something coming back into the atmosphere. And that's what that was. Cause they knew where that was coming from. So any of the UFO reports that happened, cause I, you know, I think some UFO sites say, Oh, like a bunch of people saw there were a bunch of UFO reports. I think there were like 200 something UFO reports that night, you know, even before the Rendlesham forest incident, but most of that was meteors or the, you know, the rocket breaking up when yeah. it came back into the atmosphere. So when they're seeing they're seeing them through the trees, they're not actually on the tape saying that it's moving through the trees. Yeah, that's not what they that, said. That came or later. Yeah. Th now, okay. they did say that it looked like it was moving, but they were moving they and were moving the light it, okay. was moving. They were walking towards them probably right. and it looked like it was moving through it, right. And honest, and it should be noted too that the first night. Now, this is before Colonel Halt was there, before the tape or anything like that. Two of the guys, Burroughs and the guy whose last name I can't pronounce, other the, a guy other than Pennington. Yeah. Those two guys pretty much came out and said that it was the lighthouse beacon. Okay. I mean, they pretty much said we went out in the woods and we were walking around, and then we realized that we were following the lighthouse beacon. And they just they... hadn't known what it just looked weird at the time. And then they find pregnancy. the black craft on the ground. Is that during that? Uh, Not days, well. That was no. Their was original later, report. Their original report. Yeah. So it feels like as the years went on, and maybe like I said, after it was in the tabloid, and after this story, like and after they were out traction, of service, after they were out of service. Yeah. So I feel like they kept adding details. Now it should so, be noted. So the Air Force has no record 
of Paniston and his buddy giving a report that describes the little black craft. Not that I know of. Oh. Now, a lot of them have later on said, as they would, that, you know, X-Files, oh, it's a big cover-up. Right. You know, they took it away and right. stuff like that. But it should be noted that even people that were there at the time, like I said, one of the guys yeah. that was there that night said, no, it was the lighthouse. So we, we thought it was weird because we were looking through the trees and it looked really strange. Yeah. Um, but then we realized, because they didn't know the lighthouse was there, but then when they would say, oh, it's a lighthouse, it's like circling around, you could see it from really far away. Okay, now, what, what are the other reports? Now, I, what I was going to say, though, yeah. is that... Um, you know, Jim Penniston later on said, oh, I had this notebook with me and I, and I wrote yeah. all these symbols and everything. But his buddy said he didn't have that. Right. It's like he didn't have a notebook at the time. We were just in the thing. Right. We were following this light and then Here's we went the, out and that we went back to the base and that was all that happened. The, the thing about the black craft, kind of what made me call bullshit on that a long time ago is I thought it was only two guys that went up and saw it. Turned out there were three guys on that detail. The third one, that guy that, you, that guy that you can't pronounce his name, yeah, he wants nothing to do with that story. Well, yeah, he says I didn't see any of that, but they yeah. don't ever mention that. Yeah, yeah, they don't ever mention. Yeah, that. that's what I mean. Um, he doesn't Kab want it. Kabanzag, yeah, he Kabanzag. was the one, and he was there that he was first there with night. It. So they kind of make up the story. Well, oh well, he fell unconscious. That's why he didn't see it. Now, see, that's some bullshit right there. Yeah, it's some bullshit. Yeah, he said, now, according yeah. to his then report... Then he didn't report this until right. years later. Because, like I said, I've seen all three guys' reports from the time. Yeah. Okay? Now, his report says, there was a single pulsing light. We saw it through the trees. We thought it looked weird, so we went out after it, and then we f determined that it, was, that a it was a lighthouse or, like, some kind of light beacon, and, and we went back to the base, and nothing happened. And that's the that's the report they gave. Yeah. That, that's the original report. Yeah. Now, like I said, Penniston not looking good. Penniston me. said that he saw something through the trees that he described could have been a craft. But like I said, he just even the picture right. he drew like could have been right. anything. It's not a black triangle on the ground. No, the, right. yeah, that's a big stretch. Right. Now there was another guy, um, A1C Chris Arnold, and he was the one that called the cops and he waited like at the end of the access road for the cops to come. Um, they interviewed him in 1997. And he said, and I quote, there was absolutely nothing in the woods. Okay. We could see lights in the distance and it appeared unusual as it was a sweeping light. We did not know about the lighthouse on the coast okay. at the time. Right. We also saw some strange colored lights in the distance, but were unable to determine what they were. Okay. Contrary to what some people assert at the time, almost none of us knew there was a lighthouse at Orford Ness. Okay. So, and, and like I said, the colored lights too could have been, there were a couple farmhouses over there. You could see the glow like over the horizon. Um, and also there were five radio towers about two miles uh, to the right of where the lighthouse would have been, which was the transmitting station, which had five colored lights up on okay. radio, where, radio okay. towers. Getting back to that third night, Colonel Holt's out there. He yeah. sees the blinking lights. He's doing his recording. I could have swore later on he was saying it looked like an eye that was winking. And it looked like it was dripping lava and sparks off he of it. He didn't say and lava then, until well, later. On and then he says it looks like it came out of the trees and it went over by the farmhouse and then it kind of like blew up into three other lights. Right? And mm -hmm. then there were lights in the sky and one of them shot down a laser at their feet. He did say something about one of them looked like um, it had a beam coming down. Like, the yeah. stuff that he said on the tape yeah. is really not dramatic. Okay. Um, yeah, he said, one, it looks like a winking eye. It's weird yeah. looking. But like I said, that's kind of what a light... And he was looking through a scope at the time. Okay. Um, which would have made the light super, super bright, like coming yeah. through the thing, which might have been... So it might have been burning out in the middle. Right, uh, right. Which would have given you the, the eye effect. Um, he also did say, um, yeah, I see like a bright light sort of near the horizon. There's like a beam coming down. But the thing about like astronomers have said that um, Sirius and there were a couple other stars in the sky that were super, super bright that night. that were very, very close to the horizon. And had you seen them like through the trees from that distance with all this other light in the foreground, it might have looked like it was beaming. I could have swore down. in the tape he, he said that it beamed down a, a light at their feet. Like it was trying to communicate or something. No, he did not say he that. He didn't say that. Like I said, I read the transcript of the tape and say that. nothing on the tape is really all that interesting. So, so that kind of stuff was said after it all happened. Yeah. Later on in, yeah. in, in documentaries. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like what happened here, like I said, after the tabloid picked up the story, because like I said, no one really talked about it because it happened in nineteen end of 1980. 
no one really it, it didn't really become a big thing until 1983 when news of the world kind of took off with it they had a huge headline that said ufo lands in suffolk and all this other kind of stuff um so then it kind of hit the ground running and then they start interviewing you know and colonel halt has been on a bunch of things and you know some and jim pennison and people like that have been on a bunch of things but a bunch of other people who were there that night said there was absolutely nothing unusual. It's like we saw strange lights in the woods. We went to investigate. We figured out it was the lighthouse. We went to the base. End of story. That was pretty much all that they said now, happened. My, my, my take on Colonel Holt is that Colonel Holt is kind of like a typical Air Force officer, if you ask me. He's like a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. They tend to be intelligent, have um, kind of like the kinds of guys that would like they would like Dungeons and Dragons, you know what I mean? They like yeah. they like tables and numbers and graphs, you know, they they're they're kinda imagination type guys, but they're also kinda techy in a way. Yeah. And this is pre computer era, you know what I mean? So uh, they're not quite techy by today's standards. But to me he struck me as honest. Kinda nerdy guy, yeah. you know. But maybe what it was is that uh, he kind of got caught up in the emotions of the moment with all with his his troops were you know in a high state of awareness in a high state of alert and they're excited and uh, maybe he kind of tries to convince himself that this stuff is more impressive than it really is. Because I remember there yeah. were times where you get kind of wrapped up in in a high energy situation and something happens. And it seems super impressive at the time, but if you were to go back and watch a video of it happening, you go, you're like, you're like, oh, that's all it was. I kind of feel Maybe. like that's the situation here. Right. I kind of feel like, you know, he obviously thought it was a little bit unusual at the time. Like the lights looked unusual. Yeah, and he starts firing um, himself up. He's getting, he's getting excited about it. He's like, this isn't normal. So then, you know, his imagination starts to, you know, I don't say well, and I think as the years went on, and he kind of got you know, more famous more in UFO it. circles. Yeah. I think it was, I, I, and I'm not saying that he's necessarily lying or making it up. I just think that he's Maybe he convinced himself, and convinced they, himself. They and convinced he's him that he's making it more exciting. Every time he tells Might it. Might have been a synergy of, they kind of convinced him that he saw more than what he really saw or that it looked a lot cooler than it really did. Yeah. Cause yeah. like I said, I've, I've read, been in situations like, yeah, that. it's like, I, like I said, I've read the tape and it's like, there's really, I mean, he did not even seem impressed when they first see the depressions in the ground. He's just like, right. he was just kind of like, is that it? You know, is that them? Right. And then even when he saw the marks on the trees, he's like, they look old. Um, you know, I can see the sap coming out of him. He said, he's like, oh, it's a little weird, but they could looked old. That, so he didn't, he wasn't really that impressed. Could honestly. be, could be the, the more time went on and the more he's retelling this story and the more other people are reacting to it with like, wow, wow. Yeah. They slowly kind of convince him. That's what I think. That happened. this shit was more, more impressive than what it really is. Yeah. Memory is kind of malleable. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, I think he's truthful. I don't think he's lying. I don't think he is either. I think, I think, but, I think that over time, yeah. It, it, his memories have kind of been blown into in, 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 in out of proportion about what it really was and i think you know at this point it's taken on a life of its own it's on right. like all these ufo sites yeah. and everything so it's to his advantage he goes yeah. and speaks at these conferences and people are asking him when you saw the black craft and you saw these weird lights and stuff like that so it's to his advantage to keep well, the story going he's also not seen, you know not in a negative way but just because it could be it could be also he's seen these recreations of the event and he's and remembering the, that he, and he's remembering the recreations instead, yeah. of the event goes yeah, I guess that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was that. That could be, yeah, too. I guess that's what it was. And then over time, his memories of the event have kind of become merged with the recreations of the event yeah. that have been shown on television. That happened and maybe, with Ronald maybe, Reagan. Maybe at the, time, <laughs> at the time, he wasn't that impressed, but as he saw the recreations, maybe he's like, yeah, maybe there was something to that. That's yeah, what maybe I think there happened. was something to that. Because like I said, when I read the yeah. thing of him at the time, like he seemed right. like blah. Whatever. Right. Like, but at the time, end, when they showed him the light, yeah. he was like, oh, that's weird. But it didn't really sound like right. he was like, oh, my God, it's a UFO. Right, it right. wasn't anything like that. But over time, it became that because other people were impressed. So I think he got caught up in that's the synergy exactly. of it. Exactly. That's what I think and happened. And then the memory of what it really looked like slowly gets replaced by the memories by the of what other people are telling yep. him. To the recreations, what they're telling him it looked like. And he's like, yeah, that probably, yeah, that was pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. that's it right there. 
That's yeah, it. That's exactly you, what it looked that's like. That's probably what happened. So like you said, yeah. And and like I said, the same thing happened with Ronald Reagan. He would, he would tell stories like, I did this and that, but really it was like some shit that happened in a movie. You know, he never really did. Really? When was this? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. there was, I can't remember, like, it, he did it like several times, but. Um, he forgot. He that, forgot. That he was just acting a role. Yeah. yeah. He forgot that it was um, a movie a and he thought that it was something he really they did. really did. And yeah. actually it wasn't even necessarily movies that he was in. It was just movies that he movies had that seen he saw. too. Um, that he had just, once he got older and kind of got into dementia. Well, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that uh, in his second term, he was, uh, his, his mind was That's what slipping. I mean. So, yeah, so he would like... It wasn't malicious. He was just... He, yeah, he, he would dementia. just like say stories that he thought he remembered, but they were actually yeah, yeah. from movies. Right. So I think that's kind of a similar thing that's going on here. I think like the more it goes on, the more he gets encouraged, um, you know, by various documentary filmmakers and UFO yeah. buffs and stuff like that. To, the more his memories kind of change right. into what they told him it is. Right, that it was replaced. Because uh, as yeah. I said, at the time, the report was... Uh, even like the report he made uh, two weeks after the incident, which like I said, was just called Unexplained Lights, not classified in any way. They obviously didn't think it was anything worth anything. Um, cops came and looked at the, you know, for the lights. They said the only lights we can see are from the lighthouse. Uh, the cops came and checked out the depressions. They said they don't look like anything, look like animal It's burrows. easy to do. I've told this story several times on the show. I was in a guard tower overwatching an Egyptian civilian airstrip right outside Sharm El Sheikh in the Gulf of Aqaba. Part of our job was to, import, to enforce this UN peace treaty. By treaty, no military aircraft should have been landing at this airport. It was civilian stuff only. So I'm up there in that guard tower watching that landing strip. It's boring. Boring, boring, boring. Maybe a plane will land every three or four days. Now, that's what kind of traffic. It's a little bitty airstrip. I was writing a letter, doing something, reading a magazine, and I heard a noise off to my right, and turned and looked and saw an aircraft coming in for a landing. And it just overwhelmed me, man. It, it, I, I hit the, uh, the intercom and I said, there's a military aircraft landing. And then it, it left my, it went behind some buildings, didn't see it, and they said, what kind was it? And I said, uh, uh, I don't know. I said, <laughs> was it a jet or was it a prop plane? And I go, uh, I think it was a jet. They said, well, how do you know it was military? And then I was like, I think it was camouflaged. And they said, a camouflaged jet? And I said, how big was it? And, and I said, I think it was like a Learjet, a, a, a camouflaged military Learjet type thing. And they said, we're sending a replacement up there. Come down here. You got to fill out a report. So I had a good sergeant at the time named Sergeant Smith. And he's like, because I know when sometimes when you get shocked, you can't really describe it. What was it really? You know, I said, oh, I said man, I, I don't know. It was a military craft. I can tell you that it was military. He said, we're going to get in the vehicle. We're going to go down there. We're going to drive down there. We're going to look at it. When we got there, it was an orange and black C-130, which is a cargo plane with propellers on it. It was nothing much bigger than a Learjet. It was not camouflaged. It was painted up like a damn circus tent, orange, white, and black. And it was military at one time, but it had turned. It was, you know, it was bought by a civilian company. So that just goes to show you how your your memories can really be fucked up very quickly after seeing something, so especially you, if you're in a high state of emotion. So you were, as they say, fractally wrong. At least you knew it was a plane. I knew it was a plane, and I knew it was military. <laughs> You didn't say it was like a hot air balloon or anything. Right. <laughs> and after seeing that, a lot of that World War I camouflage called Dazzle, where they would paint these weird patterns on ships and stuff that kind of confuse your aim, I could see how that could probably work. Yeah, because you'd look at it and go, like, whoa, 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 what the fuck is that? And you would have a hard time identifying it because it just if it shocked you. So that may have been what, what Colonel Holt is talking about something similar to that he saw it but his memory of what he saw wasn't very distinct because it probably wasn't that impressive but then later having people repeating alternate versions of it over and over again seeing react and seeing 
reenactments of the of it over and over again it's kind of erased the original memory yeah. and replaced See, it this with is this. why i always like to go back to like original the original memos the, the original. original newspaper reports original anything because right. people like make up shit over this like not maliciously not on purpose it's memory isn't that it's good just, that's the way human memories work they're very fallible yeah and i feel like that's kind of the case here like i said i don't no malice intended on anyone's part i'm sure it's just that over the years details have been added but like i said some of the people that were there at the time you know have said look we just saw a weird light in the woods we followed it it was a lighthouse end of story that's all that happened we didn't see any craft in the woods nothing like that happened there was no weird symbols nothing like that yeah. and the interesting thing too is that you know as the years have gone on i guess um to get over the cognitive dissonance um, you know, a lot of them will say, oh, well, our original reports were covered up or um, I believe a couple of the witnesses say they've been threatened, like, you know, high, military higher ups have told them bullets are cheap and stuff like that. But I'm like, well, they're not stopping you from going on the sci fi channel and talking yeah. about it because obviously you'd be dead by now. There's one there's one there's one witness that I think's lying who said that he saw it land in another spot, too, and it was a triangle and ghost alien spirits came out of it that had faces and they were bu and yeah, there was a whole film crew filming it, and it was like something about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and they silenced everybody. I'm telling you, because there's, always, on, there's always one that has to. You know, it was my job to, to it was my job to work in military bases, all right, including Fort Campbell and uh, uh, Camp Greaves up in Korea, the Second ID, the First and the Five of Six, which is uh, right where they have those peace talks with the North Koreans. This is back in the first Gulf War telling you you can't get away with anything on those things man because everybody's everywhere and everybody's watching everybody yeah i mean and you know and, and and soldiers and airmen and servicemen they're like bitches man you talk about you talk about talk you can't keep a secret there those guys <laughs> man you talk about yeah those guys will gossip they'll gossip harder than any woman you can't keep a secret there. You know everything. I've always found men to be worse men are gossips than yeah. women. I mean, yeah. in my experience. And if if there was a, a, aliens and shit going on there, man, you they would have all known it. They've been down there with cameras, and they've been. And when we were on the DMZ, we got photographs of some shit that, you photographs that really should have never happened. I, it, it's a different world. So I could probably sit and tell it now. I have pictures of katusas that we knew. Shaking hands and hugging North Korean soldiers across the D MDL on yeah. the outside, yeah, which they could go to prison for that, and those North Koreans could probably been executed for that. We had photographs of it, yeah, of them hanging out, yeah, smoking cigarettes, and we used to trade across that MDL. Yeah, hopefully no one will hear Food this, and hopefully, hopefully you guys. Those guys are all gone. Those many guys years all, later, <laughs> those guys are all gone. The tension's going away. But like I said, I think the funniest thing to me, and especially like I said, that's why I'm not a real big believer in these big conspiracy theories and stuff like that, because it always seems like people will come on a sci-fi documentary that millions of people watch and go if anybody knew they'd have me killed i'm like dude you were on millions of people yeah. are watching you right now and you were still alive if they yeah. wanted you dead you'd be dead already believe yeah. me they would you would be if, if if they cared about what you were saying you'd be dead already they wouldn't let you go on the sci-fi channel anything super about secret it. like like that involving aliens let's say there were aliens it wouldn't be done by the military it would be it would be private contractors yeah you can't trust guys in service, say, 18, 19, 20-year-old guys that blab. Well, and that's a, something, too, yeah. that a lot of people forget is that yeah. the, th the three guys that initially saw yeah. the weird lights, I mean, these are like 19, 20-year-old dudes. They're kids, yeah. pretty much. You can trust them with physical things, but you, you can't trust them with things like aliens and crap like that. That's going to be guys that are contracted by in echelons above reality, Something having to do with the CIA or DIA, something like that. It's going to be a shadowy civilian group. Well, guys with ex-military backgrounds in a government group, but they don't wear uniforms and they're not around anything military. It's, it's you know what I mean? A lot higher security than that. In other words, uh, invisible shit. You know? Invisible. Invisible shit. Yeah. But yeah, so like I said, I, Reynolds and Forrest is as much as, and I, I don't know much about UFO lore or anything like that, but even I had heard of this incident and had seen some stuff on documentaries about it. But as I said, the more I, do, the more I looked into it, the more I read the original memos from the time and stuff, yes, you could come out and say, oh, they've been falsified, blah, blah, blah. 
But it's interesting to me that some people that were there at the time said, look, there's nothing, there was nothing there. It was like nothing that big of a deal. We knew exactly what it was after a few minutes. Yes, it looked weird to start with, but then we figured out what it was and that was all there was to it. Um, and a lot of the stuff was kind of added later on, just like a lot of the shit that we talked about with the mass hysteria the, stuff. and The cool that. shit was added on later on by guys that had yeah. left, their left service. Yeah. Now that they're out of it, they're, they can't be punished. That's why I'm saying, why didn't they... Re- the reason why they didn't report the black craft on the ground during that time period, because had they reported that, that would have been their ass. Yeah. You'd have gotten in a lot of trouble. Yeah. You can't put up a false report. Well, probably because they didn't think of it. So once later. they got out, they could say that. <laughs> yeah, later on, they'd be like, what? Yeah, what yeah, we saw this black thing. Yeah, it was like a little black, and there was all these weird symbols. It was pretty cool. Like yeah. But like yeah, I said, saw, we saw aliens. When that we dude didn't even have that notebook at the time. According to the yeah. other people there, they said he didn't now, have a later, notebook, and we were only there for a couple minutes. He and said in, he didn't in have time. In the past to do. two or three years, that same guy, what's his name? Holt? No, no. Um, Peniston? Yeah. Peniston says that in that notebook, or in another notebook, there's a bunch of zeros and one that he wrote down, which was a code that he was in his head that he got from the, the alien download. Oh, it's a secret message. I didn't see that. Yeah, the alien download. And that came out like a couple years ago. So like, like I said, people yeah. can't just Once like... Once I, I said that, this aspect of the case is pretty bad. Although I think Holt saw the, the lights, but I think that was the tower and the and the um, the, light uh, the lighthouse. And see, that's I the thing, though. I think they kind of got caught up in the moment. If, you know, if all you did, you just saw some weird lights in the sky that could have been anything, you don't get to be on TV just yeah. for that. You have to right. like make up some There's better shit. Stuff. You have to like have to. Well, see he didn't aliens. really make it up. I think, like I said, I think he kind of got manipulated in it over yeah. time. Although I'm not saying that there's no. I believe that there are extraterrestrial craft come every now and then, if that's what you want to call them. Craft. They may not be craft. That might be the extraterrestrial itself. I don't. Now there's better case. Another one's the the triangle over Illinois that all the cut that those two or three cop, yeah, different police stations saw it. Uh, that one cop got a photograph of it with a Polaroid camera that was in the back of a trunk, and you can see what three red lights but that's it you know yeah um the thing is is whether or not was that extraterrestrial i think that might have been some kind of stealth blimp you take a stealth blimp and you put a bunch of led lights on it back before led lights were common and you 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 light it in a way to make it look like an extraterrestrial craft so when you see it you're totally dazzled and you think it's an alien craft not a, a not a reconnaissance zeppelin yeah. And then when you report it to the police, you say, what did it look like? Oh, well, it had lights on the corners. It was triangle. On the back, it had pulsing bars. It was an alien crap. You know, man, get out of here. They don't want to hear that shit. Well, yeah. So that would be an excellent camouflage to take a platform like that and make it look like an extraterrestrial craft. It'll dazzle the hell out of you. When you go to report it, the reports wouldn't be believed. Yeah, everyone would just think you're yeah, a crap They think pot. you're crazy. <laughs> so you could it's take a, clever. you could take a craft like that, like a stealth zeppelin that can hover and it's quiet, and you could put that into enemy airspace, and people would see it and not react. They just stand there with their jaws, you know, open, going, yeah. "Fuck, that's an alien craft." And then they kind of be afraid to report it. That's a hell of a camouflage. Well, and like you said, if you see something that unexpected, you're not going to remember it, right? You Later, might anyways. be dazzled, and then you go, like, "Well, how do I report this?" That's how come, like, yeah. that's how come when when you know a crime is committed and a lot of yeah. people see it, like their description of the perpetrator right. like differs wildly because. Well, in this case, though, the cops un- uniformly described it pretty accurate. But the thing is, yeah. is they're not believed even to this day. Yeah. So that's a hell of a camouflage. But the thing about that, where you could that, go in there and with impunity and be seen and not believed. But the thing about that case was that it wasn't super. Cra- I mean, they didn't say there was little gray aliens no. and they took a, stuck a probe up my butt or anything like that. They were like just basically I saw weird lights in the sky that could have been an alien craft. It could have been no, like some of, kind of stealth technology. That's pretty much the, all they the said, right? One of the cops saw it at a few hundred feet away. Yeah, about a hundred feet off the ground, buzzing. And it was triangular, and it had a pattern on it, and then it took off at a high rate of speed, low, across uh, the fields. Um, it, the acceleration was good, and it was quiet. Some people might say, well, that's got to be alien. Eh, no. Nah. A, uh, a buoyant aircraft like a solid-body Zeppelin, under the right circumstances, with the right kind of propellers, and if they're, especially if they're silenced and they're inside of the craft, you could probably get that to move pretty quick, pretty quietly. And yeah. you, that buzzing sound, I think, might have been the sound of propellers 
But, you know, imagine the propellers were inside the craft, you know? Yeah. It's bringing in air through vents and blowing it out through the back. Yeah. You know, to keep the sound down. That'd be a hell of a craft. Yeah. Yeah. Because I imagine a, a solid-bodied Zeppelin that's semi-weightless, even with propellers, would probably be pretty quick. I bet you could, it could climb like crazy because it's lighter than air. Yeah. Lighter than aircraft. But kind of getting off topic. I was just thinking that, like, you know, the whole story of the Christmas star and no room at the end and shit. It's like, that's kind of like the oldest UFO story. <laughs> that didn't happen. Though. I know. That didn't happen. Well, yeah, that's yeah. exactly. <laughs> they're talking about, they're talking about Zodiac signs and stuff. Yeah. I just wanted to relate it back to Christmas before we wrap no, up No, you can go back to Ezekiel's wheel and all that. You can go back to the, like, isn't, isn't that what Ezekiel's wheel and everything? Yeah. You could, might be able to say that that was a UFO, but. Yeah, true. That's not what they're talking about. Though. No, I know it's not. I was they're talking about cherubs. Like I said, I'm just, I was just trying yeah. to relate it back talking to about Christmas cherubim. somehow. Cherubim and seraphim and stuff all like the, that. All the three wise men seeing a yeah. UFO up yeah. in the sky while they were bringing presents. <laughs> to little, How does the light go little around? Little Jesus. Then the, the lights and, and, it, and it goes around and then it points out down to where the baby is. Right it, here. Bah, right bah, here. Bah, yeah. Bah, bah, bah. yeah. I challenge like... you to go try to <laughs> follow a star and see if the star is pointing to anything. It was God's flashlight. That's yeah. what that was. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, okay. So we've gone on like long enough about all of these crazy UFO stories that all happen around Christmas time, as a matter of fact. Hope you guys have enjoyed this special Christmas edition of the 13 o'clock podcast. And hopefully you had a lovely Christmas or holiday or whatever it is that you celebrate with your family, with lots of food, with presents, with cool shit like that. And uh, hopefully we we were part of your holidays. That'd be kind of nice. Um, and remember, if you like the show, to like, share, subscribe on all your social media. Uh, share with all your friends and family. And if you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. Or you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account if you'd like to give a one time donation. If you want more Christmas goodness, you can check out our last movie retrospective, which was a Christmas double feature of Christmas Evil and The Christmas Chronicles, starring Crossell as Santa Claus. Okay. And mm -hmm. <laughs> that will do it for our Christmas special, episode 123. And we will see you next time. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. <laughs>